to our Quora session. This is a bit of an experiment. That's why it's a three hour live stream session. If I have to go like take a break, I might have to go take a break, right? And we'll put something up on the screen while I go take a break because it's gonna be three hours long. And so the idea here is, <clears throat> a core is core sessions are a new thing that Core is doing. And the idea is, is to generate interaction around questions and then get answers. And so it's kind of like me writing a blog live with you watching and helping. And so we've got a YouTube stream and I will be looking at the YouTube stream and you can make comments. Um, and that way I can watch as uh, you can watch as I do writing. Uh, I, I don't know how it's going to work. You can pose questions in the YouTube. Uh, you can pose questions in Quora. Um, I don't know how it's going to work, right? So, so here we go. Um, so this is what a Quora session looks like. And this is what I'm seeing in my Quora session. And you see that I've got a post and I've written a couple of things already. Um, and you can upvote the questions. And so, so we, I've been sending this stuff around for a while and, and everybody just upvotes like the things I've already answered, which is okay. But I think the idea was we were supposed to upvote um, the ones I hadn't answered. So we figure out which, uh, which answer, or maybe what that's what this follow number means. So how can we embrace, so that must be it. So someone must have said, I'd like to see this one answered. And so we got this follow thing. Um, and so let's see who, which one has the most follows. So if you come and follow these things, then, so I've already, I got, you know, I, I got some of these answered already, and, but they are the more popular ones. I kind of knew what the more popular ones were gonna be. Um, so let's see, let me add something here in the chat. Hi all, the stream, oop, 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 oop. stream has started. And I will watch this chat. Chant, chat, Chuck. Can't even type my own name. It's not, this keyboard's not right in front of me. Cause I have two keyboards. One is the actual keyboard I'm gonna do. Um, so hi all, the stream has started and I watch this chat, Chuck. Okay, so let's take a look at the questions. Oh boy. So I got four follows on how do we increase diversity in technology. That's a that's a hot button, and so uh, and so here we go. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's work on that one. So I'm going to start writing. You can comment. Um, so let's just start writing this one. How do we ingre increase diversity in technology? So I'm going to answer it, and let's go ahead and start. So. So I, I think I think the biggest problem is in the educational system. I think the I think the problem is that we have a we have built programming classes that aim to filter for those who might be uh, really great, strong, really strong abstract thinkers. So, so build primary classes that act to filter. So, so, so the, the idea, oh wait, we got a, hey Tim, um, can you take over Studio Age presentation because somehow it logged itself out? Go to log it back in. So I'm talking to Tim, our, our control room guy, because I can't see the, the YouTube comments. But that's okay. I'll just keep talking to you. Um, or maybe Tim can't do that. But that's okay. And so the problem was, I don't know, I might have to rewrite all this. Um, the problem was that... 40 years ago, when I went to school, it uh, looks like Tim. Tim, that, that guy got shut down. When I went to school, programming was really, was a very technical, 
problem. Oh, great, great. Oh, hi, Miss, Mr. Starr. Oh, overview of the career. Greetings from Costa Rica. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my career in this question that I'm answering. So hopefully you'll see the question. So, so when, I, when I went into programming, it was very technical, right? Um, programming was difficult. Programs were not pretty. There were no users. There was just data and algorithms. Yeah, so I mean, I was at Michigan State University in 1975, and, and um, I was writing software, and, and I didn't even, I didn't take a programming class in high school. And, and so I, I, I saw programs, and programming is this uh, beautiful concept. Um, and, and, and I like the idea that I could focus on this computer thing, and I was a little socially inept at that age. I wasn't, I wasn't a cool guy. Probably, I'm still not a cool guy. Um, and so, for me to build a relationship with this computer thing, and learn everything about computers was just fascinating. And um, there were data, data and algorithms. Um, but to get good at it, it was really difficult. It was hard to. So think about it. Let's not say get good at it. Let's say to be a useful contributor, a contributor, contributor. Help me out. And hi. Oh, Arushki, I, that that's a, such a great question. Why don't you, why don't you take Arushki? Why don't you take that question that you just put on? I'm planning to pursue a career in computer engineering, and I want to become a software engineer. What would be an up-and-coming language other than Python, of course? So go put that in Quora if you've got a Quora account. That's a good question. Yeah. So, so in a sense, to so here I am, a young person going to college, right? And I could I could see from the courses I was teach, taking that to be a useful contributor, um, I really needed to understand a lot of highly technical things. There were no user interfaces. There was no graphic design. There was no web page. There was no portable phones. There was just like punch cards and printouts. And, and you would do calculations. And then you had to maybe build an operating system or something like that. Um, you know, I, I really needed to be highly technical. And, and, and you also need sort of this notion you needed to be able to, to look inside of how computers worked and visualize I can never spell visualize. Visualize, look inside how computers worked and visualize in your mind. So you could be a competent programmer. So, so the idea, the, 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 a, a key skill is to be able to to see something that does not exist, except in the abstract and in your mind. And, and a key to this does not exist. The key is that um, I wanted to contribute. I wanted to join the field and I wanted to contribute, and as a prerequisite of contributing, I needed to, to I need to master understanding something that you couldn't see. And it turned out that for whatever reason, I was good at that. I was good and enjoyed, in a sense, constructing a picture in my mind of something I couldn't see. Now there's lots of people for whom I turned out 
to be good at that. Who knows why, right? Maybe, maybe it was because I was good at calculus in high school. I mean, calculus, to be honest, calculus, you know, one of these days if I get really bored, I'll teach a class on calculus, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say that diversity, oh man, I need to be able to copy and paste between these things. So, so I think calculus is one of those things that also, um, which also made you be able to, to visualize things that don't exist. So if you're like learning a limit, like what's the derivative and a limit, you're, as a teacher of calculus, you have to visualize something that gets smaller and smaller and then it's infinitesimally small and your brain can't go like, I don't get it. I'm freaking out. Like, I can't see it. And, and I, for whatever reason, I did fine in calculus in high school. And so then when I show up in college and I am faced with this programming language and there's a thing you can't see and yet I need to be able to dig into this weird abstraction that you can't see and visualize all that, I was good at it. And, and so the problem is, so the, the, the problem is, is then if this is the skill set to be a full participant in the field of technology, comma, then courses were developed by people like me who rocked at calculus and those courses developed, those courses were well aligned to amplify my kind of skills and train my mind, train my mind, you know, to be very good at this very narrow set of skills. As I did in my last thing, I've had a long career over which I've acquired a very particular set of skills. Skills that allow me to understand and visualize what's going on inside of a computer. But sometimes skills that make it so I'm not so good at interpersonal communications. There you go. Luckily, I'm a teacher, so it kind of keep, keeps me drawn out a little bit. So, so, so what I'm doing here is I'm kind of saying why computer science for the past 40 years has con been constructed. It's, it's, it's been constructed by people who are good at calculus because being good at calculus led to being able to see through what computers were and see what computers are inside. So now I'm going to say fast forward 40 years. And now we have colors and upper, uh, upper and lower case. When I, was, when I started, there was only uppercase. That's how old I am. Computers only had uppercase when I started. I remember when we saw lowercase, I'm like, wow, lowercase. That's pretty cool. Like you can have your first letter of your name upper, like the word calculus can be upper. And fancy phones. And it turns out that my very, ooh, I can slide a little uh, uh, very particular narrow skills are just a small fraction 
of what it means to contribute fully and, uh, and with high value to technology. So, so the, eh, can't type, can't type. So the point is, is right now, I mean, the skills, this kind of core programming skills, those people who might work in the Linux operating system, and if you're working in Linux operating system, you still have to be able to create pictures in your head from really abstract stuff. Those are still valuable skills, but, but if you take them as a pie chart of what we need in technology today, that particular set of skills is valuable, but a small fraction. And the problem then is, computer science education has not changed with the times. Yeah, so computer science education has not changed with the times. Computer science education continues it continues to focus on that very calculus like skill of abstraction algorithms and data structures and sadly Companies like Google, Facebook. I'm about to say something mean. And Amazon use programming interviews. To pick their technologists. Why? Because the people doing the hiring went through the crappy computer science program. And they figured to themselves, well, if I had to go through a crappy computer science program, and I know all about, like, hashing, then maybe you should too. So, and so then we got a self-fulfilling prophecy. If computer science curriculum, uh, computer science faculty don't keep teaching the way they did 40 years ago, you can't get a job at Google. And they failed you. And let's save that as a draft. Save as a draft. So they failed you. So they're in a bad spot too. They might even feel like they want to re revise how computer science is taught. Um, but if they do, then they're harming you. You come to a, a world-class university like University of Michigan and you would like to get a chance at a Google job because that's pretty cool. I mean, there's nothing, I mean it's cool to get a Google job. There's no, I don't disagree with that. Um, so how, how do we solve that, right? How do we solve that? Um, and so it turns out that Google needs a lot of people with a lot of different types of talent. They don't just need one kind of person, even though almost all their hiring interviews are filtering for one kind of person which then puts back pressure into computer science curricula if you want to be an elite computer science place. And so the answer, my answer is to make a MOOC. <laughs> that does not try to make you one of those calculus types. And it doesn't depend on, and it does not depend on. 
I can't type fast enough. So, so I, I, I so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll edit this some more. I'll just talk for a while. Um, I'll post it. We'll put her up there. We'll see what people think. And so, um, so for me, the way that I want to increase diversity in technology is to create super talented people that are not calculus nerds. And these talented people have got to have a broad understanding of web design, usability, programming, CSS, JavaScript, database. These are all so much easier to learn than the algorithms and data structures that um, computer science has been teaching for all this time, but they don't, they don't know how to change. And so what I'm trying to do ultimately, personally, is create an entire curriculum that can put you in a job-ready situation that is not a computer science curriculum so that we can create people that can fill roles in technology organizations and uh, technical positions in non-technology organizations um, without having you have to go get a computer science degree. And, and so I've been critical of computer science, but I'm a computer scientist and I love the knowledge that I got with my computer science education. And so I don't want to say that you shouldn't be a computer scientist. What I think you shouldn't do is you shouldn't take your first programming class from a computer scientist. Now, of course, it's kind of ironic that I'm a computer scientist <laughs> and I'm teaching you programming, but I'm not teaching you programming like computer scientists would teach you. And if I were a faculty member at a good computer science department and I taught Python for Everybody as the first programming class, they would fire me. And they would fire me because I'm not rigorous enough. They're like, oh, you're not rigorous enough. I'm like, well, okay, I'm not in the computer science department. I don't have to be rigorous. I just teach people what I think they need to know and prepare them for a career that's not exactly a operating system developer at Google. And I let them do that, right? And part of my goal is to prepare you for a career without you going into computer science. But also one of my goals is so that if you do have that set of skills that really are, you want to be a great computer scientist, I want you to walk into that with joy. I don't want you to walk into computer scientists, think you want to be a computer scientist, and take their vicious first class, flunk out of that class, and think, you know what, I'm bad at this, because you probably aren't bad at it. They just are bad at teaching it. So, okay, I got I to gotta get off this topic. That was a quick 23 minutes. Let's see what's going on. Let's see what's going on. I'm getting a... Um, so, so let's just answer some of these things. Um, when, will you, when will your next course be available? There are some really nice visual tools out there. Now, I've heard, not heard about GeoBra and Desmos. Um, Josh. Yeah, so I would say, Josh, in your, in your early 40s. So I think the answer is you, you can... You can switch into the programming career. So I do have that other, the, the most highly voted question that I have is, um, let's go back to my course session. The most highly voted question I have, which is one of my favorite questions and favorite answers, is this how to get your first programming job. So Josh, this is kind of the question that I've already written. Um, and, and so I, I would suggest that you take a look at the question that I answer, and I'll just kind of summarize it. And that is that um, it's, it's hard, but it's in the short term, it's hard and it feels like you're never making progress. But in the long term, once you've done it, you'd be like, oh, that was easy. Because I get email from people all the time that says, I took your class and it changed my life. And they're looking at that like five years, like five years ago, I took your class and it changed my life. And I'm like, yep. But if we would stop and ask that person what it was that changed their life, They'd be like, well, it was like 70 little things over five years that did it. And so you can't expect that just taking a class, I, I kind of had this theory that when I got my PhD, a, a limousine would kind of pull up outside the building and say, Chuck, here's your limousine. The rest of your life is easy. And I'm like, well, why would, if there's no limousine, why did I even get a PhD? 
So I was kind of disappointed that like, you know, they're like the heavens didn't open and there wasn't singing and all that when I got my PhD. And the same is going to be true for you when you finish your first programming class, Josh. Um, but then 10 years later, my life was so different. And it was all because of that PhD. Now, at what moment, and by then I had formed the Sakai Project and was working at the University of Michigan, was teaching at the University of Michigan. Like I could, those are things I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't have made a plan, right? But I needed to get that education first. And, but the thing about it is sometimes you, you, you can't imagine all the cool things that can happen to you, right? And that's how my life has been. I, I didn't have a plan. I just worked hard, lived in every moment during that time, and did as much as I could and focused on that moment, just like I'm focusing on this moment right now. And then somehow in the future, something good's gonna happen. And so if you look at the question I have here on Quora, it's like, just don't stop. And, but it's more than just not, don't stop learning, right? It's, it's keep your joy, right? It also means don't rush, right? Don't stop, don't rush. Don't think that you've got to like quit your job, go into debt, you know, live in a van down by the river and program so that you can take a Python class in one month so that then your whole career is going to start because you're going to be disappointed. And you also lost your joy. And I, everything I do, every class I teach, I hope you see this in some of the classes that I teach, I don't want to hurt your joy, right? I want you to be smiling. I want you to be happy. I don't want you to look at the assignment that I've given you as some mean thing I've done to you. I don't waste your time. I value your time. You're not my subjects. I'm not the king of Python and you're just my mere subjects and I want you to build me a pyramid, right? So, hey, I'm the king of Python. You're my subjects. Go get some rocks, make a pyramid. No, I want you to be happy. I don't just want a pyramid. I want you to be happy. And, um, and so as you're moving towards your career, when it comes time to find that job, you being a happy, sane, calm, competent individual is, 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 is as important as how much skill you have. And so keep learning, keep your joy up, don't hurt yourself, don't, don't be disappointed when it doesn't happen right away. Right? And so that's what I say in this particular one. Right? And, and I'll be honest, COVID makes this hard. Because I used to give you the advice that says, go to a Python meetup in your town. There's Python meetups, there's Django Girls meetups, volunteer at, like for Django Girls. You don't have to be a girl. Django Girls is just a way to say it's for everybody. They're, that's their way of saying for everybody. Django Girls is like their version of Django for everybody. So go somewhere, help somebody. Just sit in the back and listen at a Python users group. Go to a PyCon. Again, this is post-COVID, but COVID won't be with us forever. Um, you will be amazed at how much you're energized. And you'll actually then be amazed at what the demand is for Python programmers. And you'll realize as people talk about stuff and you're sitting in the back of the room and you actually understand what's going on. That's good, right? Okay. Yeah, so let's see what else we got going here. So Jesse, useful and hopeful advice for a current PhD in STEM, but not computer science. Oh, and there goes our presentation. I'm not, I guess I'm not moving my cursor enough, Tim, um, but that's okay. Now you know how to fix it really fast. So, um, so, so, yeah, so for, for STEM, if you're getting a PhD in anything, and there's a lot of people to get the PhD students in like biology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that are taking my classes. And, and the key thing is, is if you're in a STEM field, I don't care if you're in biology or chemistry, it is very unlikely that you're going to get by without Python these days. And um, if you just, it, and it doesn't really matter STEM or not STEM, you go into usability, you go into this, that, Python, absolutely is a thing that 
increasingly everybody just needs to know no matter what. And in STEM fields, it's doubly so. Let me tell you a, a little quick story. Um, through a strange set of connections, my son and I were allowed to go to the behind the scenes of on the set of the movie Avatar as they were creating movie Avatar and uh, and we got to walk in the studio we got to watch them building the graphics of the movie Avatar and we basically had to sign a piece of paper that says this person who's given you a tour of this studio if you turn out to reveal anything you see here we're gonna fire that person <laughs> so that's your security right uh, you know the, the whole idea is if you if you reveal a secret of an in-production thing, uh, someone's going to get in trouble for it. Because this, you know, like the Avatar, we were six months before and we were looking at rendered screens. And it was cool. But the most important part of the story is I was walking by and I saw a bunch of people like on monitors taking the blue blue creatures of Avatar and moving them around. And I was, I was someone around Python. And I'm like, what are you doing with Python? You look like an artist. He's like, yeah, I am an artist. He said, but we got these things. So we got to do them every night. And then we, I made a little script, and it saved us a lot of time. And so here you are, uh, you're a graphic artist, and you're designing the beautiful avatar. And yet you're sitting in front of a computer typing Python because you got to get work done. So, okay, let's see what else we got going on now that this thing is back. I should probably move this once in a while. Uh, Nathan, what do you miss about the old days of programming? Um, I don't know. I guess the one thing I, I, I miss about the old days of programming is cards, punch cards. The, the fact that your programs sort of had a, a physical manifestation and you could carry your programs with you. Now, they weren't very good programs and they weren't very sophisticated programs. And then when you would put your cards in a card reader, it would go waka, 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 waka. And then you would punch little holes in the cards and it was all very analog, right? And so the, the thing I miss was um, like uh, when printers, printers used to be these things called line printers and they made these loud noises, these chains of letters would go by and little hammers would hit the things. And I liked the fact that it was sort of analog and you were carrying things and you were physically seeing things and you were watching the cards go through. If you ever get a chance, go to the... Uh, the Living Computer Museum in, uh, in Seattle. And in the back, they've got a CDC 6500. And actually, if you look, you can probably Google, uh, let's see what I can find here. Let's see. Charles Severance IEEE Computer CDC 6500. Yeah, not, not that you would know to Google that particular thing. Charles Severance yeah, so there's a video where I went out there and I made this really cool video. I mean, I won't... Oh, and there's Robert Larson advertising on the front of my video. It's not my video, it's IEEE's video. Hi, Robert. My family is a fan of Robert Larson. Okay. So, yeah. So you'll see he runs cards through, I think this is, yeah, this is the CDC. So the that's the computer that I, that CDC 6500 was a computer, and it's got a card reader, and I could go back and I could hear all the noises and all the things, because computers were kind of this interplay between the physical and um, the digital world, and that's the one thing that I kind of missed. Um, so May, Python is still too abstract. Um, we need a more clear way of programming, because you merge text with calculus and symbols. It's... Uh, it's uh, really a headache. Hmm. I'm trying to understand uh, what you're thinking about there. Um, one of my first languages was a language called APL, which stood for A Programming Language. And um, it was a much more uh, succinct programming language, but, um, and it was more elegant. And I think I even talk about it in some of my courses. It had an assignment operator that was an arrow. So instead of saying x equals x plus 1, you'd say x arrow x plus 1. And, um, and, and I like that because it gave you a sense that there was a movement because assignments are a movement. And so I like that. But then the problem is, is if you have too much like 
super specialized syntax, it's actually harder to learn. And one thing I like about Python as a first programming language is there's a just the, the minimum number of primitives to get a lot of complex things done. And once you know those primitives, you can write more sophisticated things. But um, that's why I, like, I love Python. Um, so, Dr. Chuck, can you make some courses on data science? Really would love that. Well, Sam, the University of Michigan has uh, on Coursera, uh, my, my good friend um, Chris Brooks and some other colleagues have built a thing called, uh, ads, what we call AdSwapy internally, Applied Data Science with Python, AdSwapy. Because um, we're nerds and we always got to come up with a, a code for things. And AdSwapy is a very, very popular uh, data science, uh, intro to data science. And I think Chris and that team is working on another one. So I don't feel any need to do that because I think Chris has done a great job. And Chris Brooks is a way better data scientist than I am. Um, I'm one of those, I'm like, a, I'm like a kindergarten teacher. I teach you like how to do basic stuff like wipe your nose and not sneeze on other people. And that's what I teach you. And then you go off and you're very sophisticated. I, I get email from people who took my class a year ago and they ask me some question. I'm like, I don't know the answer to your question because you're more sophisticated than me at this point. So, yeah. Um, da -da 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 Learn this book. Okay. Um, Sam, hey, Chuck, in order for me to have an interactive web app, what do I have to study? I'm so stuck. Sam, I am too. I've been, I've been grousing about this on Twitter lately. Whoa, hit the, hit the thing. <sighs> For me, there just is no good answer to the question of how to build an interactive web app. I, I teach a class, Django for Everybody, and that's one way to build interactive web apps. I teach a class called Web Applications for Everybody. And that's how to build web apps with a PHP-based system. I write on the Sakai project. I work on Java. And those are hard. They're hard ways to build it, but they build super fast and super scalable systems. Um, and everybody else like uses something like React or whatever. And so I'm this summer, I might have to teach myself React because, but I don't like React either. But the problem is everyone else is using it, and so I might have to learn it. So I don't, Sam, I, I don't have that answer. Um, and, and so for me, I not, I'm not at the point where I say I have finally found the perfect way to build a web application. What I'm tending to do is just saying, usually I'm joining a team or meeting other people, and if I'm on a team with five people and four of them know a way to do it, I'm like, yeah, I know CSS and JavaScript. I can figure all that out. You're using X. I'll just use X. Just tell me, tell me where I fit in. And that's how I learned Java when I started the, with the Sakai project. I mean, that decision was made before I arrived. And I'm like, show me how to work. I mean, I can write code. And so there's all this thing about what's the ideal thing. And if you get in that debate about is React better than Angular or is Svelte better than React or is um, TypeScript better than JavaScript, there just is no good way to get to the ideal. The fact that there are so many things out there like that suggests to you that there is not a good single answer. And it, it's just whatever works with the team that you're on. And so I'm, I use things I don't like, but because I'm on with a team of people, I like the fact that that team of people um, knows that stuff and that I can lean on them because they know that stuff. And so I'd rather be in a situation where I can learn it myself and then lean on people who are smarter than me, then by me knowing what perfect is, saying, sorry, you gotta rewrite everything in my favorite little thing of the day. Because I've been doing this a long time and the favorite thing of the day changes all the time. And so it, that, it, it's an important question, but it's, it's unfortunately they're not something for which there is a, uh, a good answer. Let's see. I got some of those questions. Let's see if there were some questions. Oh, <laughs> Arushi, I like your question. I'll read it. You probably are trolling me, but in a good way, right? So Arushi says, sir, your assignments are a lot more fun than the assignments we have in school. You, with a big smile. 
a big smile emoji. So I, I, you're trolling me, but if you're trolling me, it's a good trolling. Let me show you. I, I answered that sort of that question, right? Um, let me go back to the chorus session. We got an answer for that question, kind of. Um, where's that other answer? Come on, Chuck. How do educators scale distance learning? And it has to do with the assignments. And you can, you can read this one. Um, assessments are the greatest downfall of teaching. And in this world of COVID, it's worse, not better. Because at least you would do like 80% of the assessments in a course would be crappy. And then 20%, maybe you'd do a presentation or you'd have an oral exam or you'd do a group project or something, right? Um, but then with COVID, you, you can't do that as well. And so here's the key, right? Um, here's about multiple choice questions. You can read all that about multiple choice questions. The primary indicator of how stu students learn is time on task. And that's, that's the essence of all learning is if I can trick you or convince you or cajole you into spending three hours with me, it almost doesn't matter what I do during that three hours. So what's more important for me in that three hours is for you to be enjoying the three hours. Because if you're enjoying three hours, you'll stay with me three hours. If, if, if I want to teach you something that's going to take three hours and you're miserable, after 15 minutes, you're gone. I mean, literally on Coursera, you just leave. I mean, why do you even have to stay? And, and so part of what I try to do is I try to think of ways to engage you so that you keep trying, right? And so I have these puzzle assignments. And these puzzle assignments are, and my puzzle assignment, I don't know if I said it in here somewhere, I talk about how the video game Mist was an inspiration for me, or you're just faced with a problem. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. And I, I, I'll try, I'm trying to figure out a way to put this into, um, to put this into my Django for Everybody class. But let me show you my, let me show you my favorite assessment that I've ever written. I, one of my favorite ones is in this Quora question. But let me just show you something that I'm using on campus for my final exam. Oh yeah, two-factor authentication. Approve that. Good thing I got my phone with me. So this is this is my on-campus. Someone would ask me a question. What are the aspects of a student that catcher? Oh man, Arusha, you have the best questions. You should have your own podcast where you just ask questions. No, 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 no. When I said trolling, I meant in a good way. I wasn't being critical. You know, you know me, and so you know questions I would like to answer. That's what I meant by trolling, not trolling in a mean way. I took your question as a, as a good thing. Okay, so let me show you this assessment. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And then we're still on that question. So this is my actual online live class. Here's the puzzle-based final exam. Let's hope it works, because I wrote this software. It would be super ironic if it didn't work. It's probably going to start the server up because students are done with it. Oh, crap. I just hit a bunch of buttons with my oob. There we go. Okay. This is the final exam for my online Django class. And what you do in this exam is um, this is all you get. You are given source code to a Django application. And you have to read this source code. And let me make it smaller so it fits a little better on the screen. There we go. You have to read the source code. And then you have to figure out what this code does. And it's Python code. It's Django code. And then if you can cause this line of code to execute, you get 10 points on this exam. And that's it. No explanation just source code. It's an ultimate puzzle. You have to figure this out. You got nothing but source code. 
Each student gets a slightly different version of it because it's got a bunch of randomization in it. And it is, it is my absolute masterpiece. I love it. And I want to I wanna keep adding to it because to me, this is like the final boss. Oh, let me show you another really cool assignment. Let me figure out where that one's at. Hang on. This was in Postgres. Let me show you a really cool assignment. Make it bigger here in Postgres. Um, let's go into, uh, where is it? Is it text here? Is that one in text? Yeah. Yeah, this is if you're taking Postgres for everybody. Puzzle Break a Hashing Foundation. Break, break a Hashing Function. So here's what you're supposed to do. The answer to this question is coming up with two strings. Now, a hashing function is a function that takes some text and gives you back a number, basically. It doesn't matter how big the text is. The text is big, the number is small. But a good hash, tiny permutations in the text change the number dramatically. And it has to do with algorithms and data structures. And so I give you code, and I say, this is a bad hash. That's your Python code. You can go type it in on your computer, and you can run it. And you see that if you make a change, ABCDE gives you a hash of 7 to 39. And BACDE gives you a hash of 738. And you have to tear this apart and figure out what's its, what its flaw is, because this is a flawed hashing function. Did I put the flaw in? Because I know what flaws are, and I know what good hashing functions are. And you just got to stare at this. And there's randomization, and everybody gets different versions, slightly different versions of this. I have some assignments that depending on what month you're taking the class, the assignment is different, right? That just keeps you from stack overflow in the question because you could paste this into stack overflow, say, tell me some strings in which this would match. Well, it turns out that there's like 15 versions of this. And so stack overflow will get mad at you, right? And so this is a puzzle. And all you have to do is know two strings that you can put in here. Let me see if I can guess this, right? Let's see. Let's see if A, B, C, D, E, and D, B, C, A, E. Let's see if that works. No, I got it wrong. Okay. It will take me too much time. So let's go back to assessments. Let's go back to time on task, right? Where did I say time on task? Yeah. So here's the thing. If I give you an assignment that takes you an hour, you better darn well be doing something. I, my opinion is you better darn well be doing something useful. If I want, I give you an assignment that it takes you an hour to do this assignment. When it's done, I want you to understand hashing. I don't want to just give you some really mean thing, right? I don't want to I don't want to make it so that you just have to roll a dice, you know, until you get two ones in a row or something. It's just miserable waste of time, right? So I don't want you to waste your time. I want you to spend as much time with me as you can, but then I want you to value the time that you spent. And I want the time that you spent be about learning, not about saying, I hate this teacher because this teacher just constructed an, a diabolical question that is impossible. Now, this, this is challenging, but not impossible. And when you figure it out, it takes you two seconds, even though I wasn't able to figure it out in two seconds in this particular one, and I wrote the question. But you get the idea that you want to be doing, if you go to a Python class and you're going to give me 50 hours of your life, I don't want that to be doing stuff that's not advancing your skill. And that's the value exchange, right? I designed something, so if you loan me some hours of your life, those hours you're not getting back, you're supposed to walk away with a skill, not just a grade. The grade doesn't matter. The skill is what matters. So, okay. Let's see if we got any more. Do we got any new questions that came in in Quora? Diversity. I'm not doing very good at writing because I love talking to you. Do, 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 do. Let's see if I've got more votes. Lifelong learning scale. I got that answered. Different needs. 
See, I want to see someone else. Oh, view all. There's more of them, maybe. Did someone answer? So it's chorus session, they put those in automatically. No, no one has asked a question. That's okay. Uh, let's see. Jose, greetings. I've been to Mexico City a couple of times. It'd be good to get back. It'd be good to get back once this COVID stuff. Um, let me, there was a really good question. Um, ooh, that's a good question from, I don't know how to pronounce your name because you have Russian characters in here. Could it be that I easily pass Python for everybody course but won't be able to learn everything else? That is a tremendous question. That's a tremendous question. Um, if you pass Python for everybody, you're not all that skilled at that point. Although plenty of people use that as an excuse to go learn on the job. The key to Python for everybody is not that you are have some kind of super ready skill like you can build a house, right? I taught you how to use a hammer and now you can build a house. Building a house is a very complex thing. Python for everybody means that you're ready to learn. You're ready to walk into something else where the skill is more intricate, but you know what an if statement is. You know what a variable is. You know what a loop is. You know what like XML is and JSON and all that stuff. So that in that new environment, you don't have to learn XML and JSON. You just kind of learn your thing, right? And so that's where you just got to keep learning, keep going, keep going, only at a speed that keeps your happiness up, right? And so, can you learn something? And the answer is yes, you can. Let, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a brief story. I told this to my son last night because he just finished taking a really, really hard course and he got a really bad grade, way less than he expected. But now he doesn't have to take that course, right? And what I tell him is I said that college is not about learning anything in particular. College is proof that you don't give up. That's what college is. It's not that you're a genius or not that you're the greatest programmer in the world. Plenty of people graduate with a computer science degree that are terrible programmers. But anyone graduated with a computer science degree, I guarantee you they didn't give up. And there were many times that they could get up. Uh, I could give up. So I once took a class in my programming. They made me take physics and computer science, which really pissed me off. Of course, I didn't even want to take social science. Now, I'm glad I took the social science because then when I travel to Europe, it makes some sense, some sense to me. And humanities, the, I'm glad they made me take those classes. I'm not glad they make me take physics. I wish they'd maybe take one physics class, not three physics classes. So this is like the hardest physics class. And I took the physics class and I failed it. Zero. Fail. And I took it again. And I failed it. Zero. Fail. And I took it again, and I got a four point. And that's because the last time I took it, I was chill. <laughs> I was not trying to read every word in the physics book and understand it. I started skimming the book. I started, and I let myself slowly absorb the material rather than trying to learn every word one word at a time. And so if you talk about you take a class and does that mean that you do or don't know something? Well, the answer is <laughs> you don't know, you don't really know anything, but you're, you're, that you're, you're prepared for the next experience to be, more, to be successful, not a failure. If you went on to that next experience without taking this experience, then you would fail at that, that next experience and decide that you are not skilled or not competent or whatever. Whereas now you take this experience and then this next experience and that's the one that turns out to really matter. Well, you feel good about that too. Oh, wait a sec. And now you can go on to something even more complex. And pretty soon you're like a computer scientist. Like the, the biggest thing I learned in my computer science undergraduate is not to be afraid. Literally not to be afraid. If you told me tomorrow morning my job had changed and I had to go learn a brand new programming language like React, I don't want to learn it. But I know I can't. I don't want to do React. I wish there was something better than React. But I'm going to. And I'm not afraid, right? I'm, I've, I'm, I've done enough of these things that it's not that I went to school to become a React programmer. No. I can figure this crap out. It's just the same as other stuff I always figured out. So let's see. Graphic cards. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. You're way. See, you're asking me a question. Uh, Gots, 
because you're smarter than I am. That's okay. Uh, let's see. What do I suggest as a follow-on course after Pi for you for a complete beginner to programming languages? So I actually built Django for everybody just for that purpose. And you might think that that's not what you want to do because you want to do something else. The, the, the problem with just taking Python for everybody is I didn't give you challenging, I didn't make the assignments really challenging because I wanted to take you very far. I wanted to give you an overview map of a lot of things in, in the web and HTML and beautiful soup and all those things. But if you look back afterwards, you're not the master of anything at the end of Python for everybody. So we need to do anything, anything, literally anything where you dig deeper. And if you take Django, it's Python, and when you're done with Django, Python's not going to freak you out anymore. You'll be like, yeah, Python got it. Because Python is like just like breathing in Django because it's all Python, and it's object-oriented Python. And I'm gonna, you, get your, you get your Python skill like twisted and bent and all kinds of cool things in the Django class. And so don't think of the Django class as like, okay, I'm going to be a professional Django developer the rest of my life. You may never write a Django application. But by taking Django for everybody, you're going to rock when it comes to Python. And when you're done with Django, ask yourself this question. Am I afraid of Python anymore? And that is the learning objective of Django. Plus, like a lot of the things that you're going to do are doing web applications, but you may or may not be. And so I, that's why I did Django for everybody, because I wanted a course that would fit like a glove to the end of Python for everybody, but be a Python course and not force you to learn a new language. Although you do learn JavaScript and CSS and HTML in uh, Django for Everybody. And you asked a few last night, but don't see them on core. Did you ask, Jesse, did you ask them in the session or did you ask them in, uh, in just in general? I don't even know. So that shows I don't know what I'm doing. Posts, questions. Oh, dang, Jesse. Hacking and coding in Kali Linux. Could you please make a course on ethical hacking and penetration testing? I wish. I wish I was smart enough to do that. I have a good friend. His name is Michael Hess. He works on security in the, the Drupal project. And I just love sitting and listening to him talk because he's awesome. Um, Dr. Chuck, did you ever doubt yourself on your journey with uh, computer scientists? Did you tell? What did you tell yourself? at the time? That's a great question. Um, no, I would say probably not. Um, the closest I have to that is when I went to college, I was not planning on being a computer scientist. I was planning on being an electrical engineer. And, um, and I I gave electrical engineering a try, and I just didn't like any of it. Apparently, I like calculus better than differential equations. I didn't like differential equations. And thankfully, computer science came along, and that it, and it was right for me. And it um, doesn't mean it's right for everybody. And so I think the key is not to be afraid to change. Right? And um, uh, my son, uh, you know, I encouraged him to take Python. He hated it. He took it a couple times, gave it a good try, and it wasn't for him. And uh, he's found his way into advertising. And I'm like, whoa, that gives me a headache watching what you do. And he's like, but I love it. And so his career found him. And so if you're not right for a career, what I think is your career will find you. Um, and that's one of the good reasons to go to a really good university. Not necessarily the number one on the planet university, because the pressures are very high there. But go to a university that has a lot of things. Don't go to a university that's only good for one thing. Because part of going to college, especially after the first two years, um, and this is why both my kids went to community college before they went to uh, four-year college. And that's why going to a small liberal arts school is not a bad thing. If you go to a small liberal arts school and you never see Python your whole time, I kind of don't like that so well. And I'm actually working with some liberal arts schools on helping them uh, teach Python in addition to all that other stuff. But I think that it's 
some some kids know when they're 12 years old what they want to be and as long as that stays constant and they're not doing it just because mom and dad told them because if my son did what dad told him to do he wouldn't be happy his whole life i tried to make my dad happy when i chose my career but i couldn't and then i found a career that made me happy and the same is true for my son he tried to make me happy and then he found something that made himself made him happy instead of me um and so uh so like i said your career finds you i lost my train of thought is there an age after which it is difficult to learn programming um i would say not really uh i i i think that uh there might be an age after which it's difficult to learn computer science um I think that everyone can learn programming. And I, and I hear from lots of uh, retired people who take my classes to keep their minds active. And um, you know they got all these apps that try to make you do puzzles and keep your minds active. I say write some Python code, take a Python class, write a Django application. That's a better, much more productive way than like just taking some tiles on your application and playing Simon Says on your phone and stuff. So. Let's see, how would I ever get to attend your lecture live with you in the classroom? Um, yeah, so it is funny now that I've been teaching, um, now that I've been teaching online for so long, there are lots of students that find their way to the University of Michigan and, uh, and find their way into my classroom. And it's really kind of weird uh, when you show up in my classroom and you've kind of got to know me online before. And the, the first thing is, is everyone sort of thinks I'm like a celebrity, right? That I'm like, whoa, it's Dr. Chuck. And I'm well known, but it's like, welcome, you're in Ann Arbor. It's great to see you. Come by my office sometime. So, so um, and, and you know, you, you, can, you can find other people that you've seen online and, and they're just people and um, it's, it's, not, it's not that big a deal. Uh, the place I teach at the School of Information here at the University of Michigan, we kind of have this just kind of a core value of treating students with respect and not like being on the stage and, you know, with lights and whatever and treat ourselves like celebrities. We, if you come to this campus to learn, it's, it's, it's hard work and we need to be there with you in that hard work. We can't, I, I'm not this professor who sort of just gives a presentation um, and then like, you know, hangs out with my ass assistants that carry me, all, you know, take me places. So when you come to campus, you will find that it is no big deal. And uh, coming, being in my class is no big deal. Um, it's, it's, it's not that big a deal, but it is kind of funny to, uh, for, for people to, uh, to meet me once they've uh, known me from a distance and uh, lots of students who come see me in a real classroom um, you know are coming from like China or India or Korea or somewhere and so they got to know me in their home country and then they, they do all this thing they make it to the University of Michigan they come to Ann Arbor and they show up in my class and and that's quite a journey and it's a really fun journey and it, I mean it's really fun for have to have them in class but for me is I don't make a big deal out of it I just welcome you if you were to make it to our uh, university. I would, I would observe that um, certainly for uh, students in the state of Michigan, uh, you shouldn't avoid going to the University of Michigan because of cost. If you can't afford it, uh, there are programs that try to make sure that you can get uh, financial support, uh, not just from the federal government, from, but from also the university. I don't know all the details, but I would say that um, don't assume that you can't go to University of Michigan because you can't afford it. The other thing I'll tell you that's a secret about University of Michigan, and it's actually a secret for a lot of four-year schools, it's way easier to get into the University of Michigan as a junior than it is a freshman. And the problem with freshmen is there's so many talented kids, and they apply, they come out of high school, and they apply to every dang university in the world, and it's just kind of like this so many really talented uh, young people are turned away, not because they're not worthy, but because we have 
10 times more very wonderful students applying as freshmen than we can take. And so it's not like when we make a decision about who's going to be admitted and who's not going to be admitted, the person who didn't get admitted is not worthy. They're very worthy. That They shouldn't take... And that's true for Harvard or any other place. You can be very worthy because they are unfortunately choosing among many worthy people too many that they can have, and so they come up with something. I would almost rather um, that you t say, "Okay, here's the number of worthy people, and we'll just have a lottery," rather than somehow sorting it. Because you end up with kind of, if you take the most whatever you sort by, and you take those people, you know, you, you got ten times more students than you can admit and you sort by the SAT score, you actually end up with a weird set of people. That's, it's, it's weird. And I'd rather just take the people who you think are good and would be great to have around and fun and then just roll a dice and say, well, not all of you can come. So, um, but in junior, it's a lot easier. And so that's why going to a uh, community college, which here in the United States is really inexpensive. This is more for U.S. citizens and then coming to Michigan. And we actually have a program in a school of information where we uh, actively recruit uh, talented students uh, from community college. And you might think to yourself that an elite place like the University of Michigan would look down on you because you went to a community college. And the answer is not at school of information. We've got some great students that have come out of community colleges. Um, and that goes back to like when to decide what your career is. I don't think when you're 18, you should be deciding what your career is. You should just be going to college and learning stuff and learn everything. And then when you're maybe like 20 or 21 and you've hung out and you've met people and you've seen the world a bit, going to college, taking a couple of different classes, that's when you make the decision. You don't make the decision before you go to college. I don't like when they make you, as freshmen, choose business and then you're stuck from then on or even computer science. You're, you start as a freshman and they tell you what classes to take. I think you're just unless you really know, unless you have really taken your high school time to take a diverse set of classes and see the world a bit, um, maybe you are ready to choose a career when you're 17, 18, uh, but I don't think so. Um, so will this Q&A be uploaded for later reviewing? Yeah, I think it'll end up on YouTube somewhere. Somebody owns it. Um, any plans for a meet and greet, Sam, in India? Sam, I will be in India as soon as I possibly can. I. I, I was in India. I hadn't been in India. Uh, here I am, a computer scientist, right? And I, I never made it to India for the first 35 years of my 40 years of career. And then, and then this is how I ended up going to India. I'm like, I got to go to India. So I'm going to just apply to give a talk at the India Python conference. And so like three years ago, I'm um, like, I just typed... I would like to give a talk about how my MOOC works at this India PyCon conference. And if I got accepted, then I'd have an excuse to go. I got like, oh, no, I got to go to India. So I did. And I met so many wonderful people that had been, I, I even met former U of M students who came here who from India went back to India. I like uh, several of them. I ran into them and ran into some of our alumni and met uh, young people at a Python conference. I went to... Uh, I went to a blind school. I don't remember what city it was in, and they're teaching blind kids in India Python using my materials, and I'm like, oh, it was so joyful. And I just love the Indian people. I love the Indian food. I love the Indian culture. I am, I am. Oops, sorry, I didn't hit, hit my mic. I'm. I, I mean, it just it devastates me to see the suffering that's going on in India right now, and uh, I, I. I watch that and think I can't wait to get back, but I know that in the short term, we got to do things like this. And I'm hoping I'm going to do more things like this um, just because I miss uh, visiting face-to-face. Uh, -face. And I will get back to that, um, but we've got to feel safe. I mean, if you think about it, me coming to India and going into a room and having coffee with 40 strangers, that's kind of the exact wrong thing to be doing in COVID even with masks. So we got to be really well past this before I can go back to my, I assume that you've all seen my office hours, um, you know, drchuck.com slash office, or you just say um, Charles Severance office hours, and it'll be the first link. Bang. So there you go. If you, um, 
if you go to Charles Severance office hours, you see the 70 of my visits around the world. Um, and there is a little video from each one of them. And so I go around the world. Um, Arusha, you are such a good question asker. Uh, do you think the current testing system is effective in finding the worth of the student? Please clarify. Please clarify. Do you mean like the SAT tests and the ACT tests? Or do you mean like the way we teach and, and assess? Um, so I don't know about community colleges for people who are not American citizens. The, the visa problem would be a potential problem. So I don't know that enough. Um, so. I think a more common uh, pattern uh, for folks who are not American citizens is uh, to come in the masters, come as masters, but then that's more expensive. Um, and that's another sort of thing is master's degrees are easier to get into than undergrad as freshmen. freshmen. Um, so, Oh, Marion, I love your question. I love your question. As a 33-year-old beginner with Python and Django, how much trouble will not knowing math give me? If I have anything to say about it, none. Math can jump in a lake as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, so SAT test. I will comment about SAT testing. So uh, I hate the fact that math is a prerequisite to computer science. Um, calculus... I love calculus. I don't hate calculus. Calculus is art to me, but calculus is not a prerequisite of computer science. I have in my one million years of a computer science career, I have never used calculus. Never. And I've never, I have used trigonometry, but the only time I've ever used trigonometry was when I was writing a video game. And the reason is when you're writing a video game, you got to track a thing going around on a screen. And you have to take the place it's going and you have to break it into X and Y coordinates and use sine and cosine for that, which is like the first week of trigonometry and the rest of trigonometry is crap, right? Sine, cosine, tangent. I should, I want to one day do mathematics for everybody where I only, where the only thing I teach you is the things that are useful in trigonometry, not the useless stuff. So, yeah, SAT testing. SAT testing is terrible. Uh, I don't exactly know what's going on, but I do know that uh, certainly in the School of Information, we either either weigh weight that low or ignore it completely. And I'm happy about that. Um, the SAT is, there's just no, there's no way to, to summarize people in a single number. There just, there, there isn't. And, um, and the, the problem is, is that the SAT uh, has cultural biases, you know, experiential biases, geographic biases, racial biases, gender biases, and and again, we can't keep doing that for the good of the world. We can't we can't keep just. It's convenient. It's convenient if you just use the SAT and use it as your filter, and you get what you get as a result. And that's not good. It's not what we should be going for. It's not what we should be trying for. And so SAT, ACT, I would like, I wouldn't mind something like um, you have to get a minimum. But, you know, and say, okay, at, at some level you need some basic education. I would rather have an assessment that said, look, here's some minimum things. And you can't use this score as a way to sort people. So almost think of the SAT as a pass-fail. Right, and so you, instead of saying like, I got a, you know, 22 on the ACT, and you got a 21 on the ACT, so I'm getting in and you're not, that is terrible. That's a horrible idea. But if we could say, you pass the SAT and I pass the SAT, and it tests skills that are likely to be the kind of things you need in the first year of college, like can you read and comprehend? Can you know, do you have reasonable vocabulary? That, that I can handle, but to say that this is so precisely calculated, it's terrible. Because the difference between a 22 and an SAT and a 21 and an SAT has nothing to do with whether I want a student to know a student or to work with a student, or if that student is going to be the go out and change the world in a positive way. 
the difference between a 21 and a 22 in SAT doesn't mean squat in the potential of a student. And the, and the danger is, is someone who prepares their whole life for getting a good SAT score is probably going to miss the things that are more important in life that make you a well-rounded individual. So let's see, threaded example from the industry. So can I shed some light on how I became a tutor at the University of Michigan and how it's changed my life? Well, I was driving down on Monday for and I'm like I am literally the luckiest human being in the in the world. I have in my pocket a key to a campus beautiful campus building that has a key to an office. And I have this little card and it lets me in the office and I am privileged to be a faculty member at the University of Michigan School of Information. Um, my path is a non-traditional path. Um, I, I am probably the most lifelong learner that you've ever met. I didn't get my PhD until I was 40. I went to school part-time for 20 years and I got a PhD. I initially came to the University of Michigan as a software developer and an IT person with a PhD in an IT leadership position. And um, that's kind of how I ended up involved in the Sakai project, which was an open source development project. And I led that. And having a strong computer science background was helpful. That doesn't make me, didn't make me the smartest person on that project by any stretch of the imagination nor the best programmer. But then I kind of moved into software development. And then I kind of got involved through that Sakai project with some research grants that were using Sakai to do research collaboration. And in that, I got to know faculty, right? And uh, long, long story, you can read my Sakai book. So you can go Google Dr. Chuck Sakai book. So there's my Sakai book. So I wrote a book about that Sakai open source project, which is a thing I did for the University of Michigan. I led this project. Um, it didn't. So the Sakai's are very successful, and I'm still involved in it. But for a couple of years, I had to take a break because I got upset with other people in the project, and I was gonna, I was gonna like do bad things. Not really bad things, just say say bad things and be rude to people. And I figured I'll just leave rather than be rude. And so I needed a place to go. I need I, I was like already a Michigan employee, had been a successful Michigan employee for a while. And so as I was like resigning from the executive director position in the Sakai project, I had some colleagues and they said, you know, maybe you could do teach computer classes here in the School of Information. And that's how I got to be a faculty member. And that's how I, um, so that's School of Information. So let's take a look at, uh, I'll just look at UMSI, I bet that'll get me there. Yeah, so the School of Information is where I teach. And the School of Information is amazing. It used to be a school of library science, but then added technology to it. And my job was to teach librarians how to program because we were a library school, and that's where Python for Everybody came from. Um, because I learned how to teach programming to people that really didn't want to learn it. And so that kind of allowed me to kind of prototype this idea of not teaching too hard or too much, not hurting the stu not teaching to the point where I harm the student became kind of my, my kind of concept. And, um, and so what was cool is, is that I really wasn't a library expert at the School of Information, I wasn't. I was just a computer scientist who was there to teach programming one class to librarians, which meant they kind of left me alone and I could experiment and fool around and enjoy myself. And uh, I did, and I experimented, and I built software, and I built the auto grader. I built all the things that, if you've done Python for everybody, they were all built for librarians at the School of Information. And so from 2007 to 2012, which is five years, I was kind of being a, happy little faculty member uh, teaching Python classes to librarians. And then Coursera came along and, and then I created 
inadvertently created the most popular programming course in all human history, which is Python for everybody. Um, but it, it wasn't an overnight success. It was something that took me a decade to perfect. I just happened to have perfected it at the exact right time. And so, uh, so Sam, yeah, it changed my life a lot. Um, I, I couldn't be more proud of my good fortune, and I do know that I am fortunate. It is not because of prodigious talent that I am where I am. It is, it is uh, just luck. I mean, I guess if I had anything to do with it, um, it's the fact that I tend to approach most of what I do with joy and happiness, and I'm relaxed about stuff, and I let good things happen to me rather than trying to, trying to force them to happen. Peru. Oh, yes, I want to get to Peru. So here's, here's something about COVID. I, as you can tell, I used to travel a lot. And uh, I traveled a lot. And in COVID, I mean, I found out about COVID. Literally, my son and I were at a conference in Seattle, Washington, when COVID burst on the scene and ambulances were going out and getting people. And we were pretty terrified. We got on a plane a day and a half later and came back. And, and so I was in the middle of a trip when, when COVID kind of sprung in the United States in, um, in uh, February of 2019. And I literally have not been on a plane since. And I'm not in a hurry to get on a plane, but I have um, reflected a lot on what travel has meant to me because it has been a big part of my life. And, and I've decided that uh, one of the things I'm going to do less is give research talks. I just thought back to all the research talks I've gone around and I talk about open source and I talk about this and that, and nobody listens to me. And I'm like, okay, if you don't listen to me, I'm not going to bother giving all these research talks. I mean, I got a lot to share, but nobody cares. Nobody even cares. I say, here's this free software. They're like, I don't care. What brings me joy is meeting you, meeting students. So I am going to, um, and, and like you're asking about uh, Peru. Who was it to ask about Peru? Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Peru, Peru, Peru. Yeah, yeah. Gats, Sandro. Um, what I would say to you a year ago or uh, two years ago is I'd say, well, I never have a conference in Peru, so I probably will never make it to Peru. Or I don't have a conference in Greece, so I'm never going to make it to Greece. After COVID, I'm going to go places just to meet students. I'm not going to demand that I have a conference. So I don't need a computer science conference or a school of information conference in Peru. I'm like, you know what? I want to go to Peru and just go to Peru and, and make, make it so that the main reason I'm getting on a plane is to meet you. Um, and so I'm going to spend more time with students and more time with joy and, and enjoying myself than just going to conference after conference and giving talk after talk in rooms with like not, not all that many people. So I am going to put a higher priority post-COVID on um, and seeing you. So what's the difference between the School of Information and the University of Michigan? Well, the University of Michigan is a big place. It has a medical school. It has a engineering college. It has a law school. And School of Information is one of those. So we have a dean. Now, the School of Information is smaller than the College of Engineering. The College of Engineering is gigantic. The College of Arts and Sciences is gigantic. And the School of Information is small. So we're, there's like a school of public health and um, all kinds of little schools. And so, but we're just not that different than the College of Edu Engineering, except we're just not big. And so we're just a school within uh, the university. Taiwan, what a good idea. Yeah. We could just go through all the, I'll be going to Greece. I have not ever been to Greece. I had a conference that I was going to go to in Greece as an excuse. I had it all set up and I'd had a thing accepted to go to Greece, a paper in Greece, like in August of like t last year. I was going to go to, and I had one in Berlin and then all COVID just ruined it all. So Greece is waiting. I will, I will find my way to Greece. No question. Um, Craig, you're from the UK. Well, you know well. Uh, yeah. Craig, you know that I get to the UK a lot. 
and I go to Milton Keynes and Bletchley Park, and we have quite a good time. It's a, when, when I go to Bletchley Park, the student thing is a whole day thing. I go to Bletchley Park for the whole day, and we hang out, and we have lunch together. And uh, so, oh, Arushki, you, are, you should be a talk show host. You ask the best questions. What was the topic of my research paper for uh, my PhD? Could you also give a short account of what it was about? Uh, so my research paper, uh, my PhD, let's see if I can find it. Uh, dub, 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 personal, Umish, tilde CSEV, papers. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, I can't type my own name right. Huh. No, that's not it. Automatic self-adjusting threads. I can't even find it. Where's my PhD? I lost it. Wow. I can't even find my PhD. So uh, the uh, my PhD thesis was uh, dynamic allocation of uh, compute resources uh, using a technique called automatic self-adjusting threads. And uh, the basic idea was, is in a multiprocessor situation, um, back in the day when we were building multi big multiprocessor systems as the way to speed stuff up, if you had to go, th if you had um, 10 processors and you uh, had a loop, you would just give like 10 iterations to each processor. And, and my idea was is that you actually waited till you came to the top of the loop and I had this really inexpensive way to calculate which processor should do which iteration. And that was kind of it. It was parallel processing. Um, and, uh, and so that was my PhD thesis. Um, let's see. So Craig, you're 30 years old, which means you're young. Um, oh, let me put something better on the screen here, my screen, back to the Quora session. Um, so, so the first programming job is tricky, and I, I answered this in um, in the in Quora. Um, how do you get your first programming job? It's it's really super tricky, and. Um, so, Craig, I would ask, and I'm watching the chat right now if you're listening, um, what are you doing now? And so what I say is um, that it is, it is easier to evolve a job into a from a non-technical job to a technical job for, in, in lots of organizations than it is to walk in from outside and be completely unemployed and just knock on the door and get an entry-level job. And you see on Quora here, you see, I, I talk about why it is that it's hard to just walk in the door and knock on the door at, at the University of Michigan and say, hey, I don't, I don't know much. I kind of basically know Python, and I sure would like a job. And the problem is, is that it turns out that places need people who just have basic skills. But as I say in this Quora thing, you, there are, if you post that job, 500 resumes are going to show up. And then you got to decide how, which of the 500 resumes. And then it's, it's just impossible. And so the interesting thing is, is there is an amazing gap between the demand for people with basic skills and there, there's a demand for it and there's open jobs, but the jobs never get posted, right? And so what you've got to find is a way to interact with people and find out that they have a need for a particular skill that you have, and then in you go. And this is why it's so much easier to already be working at a place. So I tell people, find a place to work that you like and has the potential for you to do the job that you want. But don't get so upset about getting the job you want on the first day, right? And so 
and another another person asks a question that, that, that kind of triggers. So in the Sakai project, the open source project that, I, that I'm part of um, and lead, we're always wondering, how do we get more people in? Because it's written in Java, which means it's really hard to do. And what we figured out, and it's kind of working, is that the first job is not programming in that project. The first job is quality assurance. And what happens is, quality assurance is a task we need done. And, if, and it's pretty easy to learn. You just have to figure out how to use the software, and there's little scripts, and you do the things that it tells you to do, and you fill out a spreadsheet that says this worked and that didn't work. And, and we pay people to do that. You know, It's not just a volunteer. We will pay you. So here you are. You're working in a technical project. You're going to technical meetings. You're rubbing shoulders with all these technical and non-technical people, and you're going to the, the user interface meeting and, the, and the, the UI design meeting and the QA meeting and the marketing meeting and all these meetings. And eventually, you're like, I'm really great at QA, but you know what? I'm going to try to fix a bug myself, right? And that first bug that you fix is really hard, and you might have to learn something. I mean, I know when I joined the Sakai project, because I wasn't the first person at the beginning, the, it took me like over a month to write one line of code. And I had a mentor, and that mentor was leading me like right to where I had to go. You know, because I was learning Java at the same time. I didn't know Java until I, I started with the Sakai project. And so, so your, your first line of code is often harder than you think. But your first contribution is often easier than you think. And so that's why you find a job based on, um, Joe, well, tell us how you did it. What job offer? What kind of job? And what, see, so Joe, the question I was asking is, Joe, oh, 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 bang, I almost knocked my laptop off. I got so excited because Joe said, greetings from Berlin. I just got a job offer after finishing the first few Python certificates. Love it. But then the question of Joe is, Joe, what were you doing before? What was the job? Did you know somebody at that job? Right? And of course, the first few Python certificates. And I would then the next thing I ask what Joe is, I say, Joe, did you really know? You know, did, did you really know everything that that job needed when you walked in the door? Or did they just bet on you because you're smart and prove that you could learn? And I'll bet it's that he was smart and could prove that he could learn, right? And so, and, and so it, it happens. It's just, it's just hard. It's just hard. North Carolina. Have I been to North Carolina? Raleigh. I've been to Raleigh. We had a, we had a, uh, there's a, there's a place that's a bar that has video games in it, in Raleigh somewhere, Raleigh, Durham area. So there's a conference that I do want to go to that I'll probably go to every year once I get back to it called All Things Open. And that's in, uh, typically in North Carolina, I think. And uh, it looks like a great conference. Okay. Yeah, Joe, you throw that out there. Like, Joe, what were you doing before? What kind of job did you get? How did you find it? And did you know somebody? And I'm just going to guess. Oh, Samarth, can I do a course on machine learning with Python? I won't do that. I, that doesn't excite me. It just doesn't excite me. Building things for people excites me. I know machine learning is important. Oh, holy crap, holy crap. Joe just answered. Joe, 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 Joe. Now you got to go look, Joe. Okay, sorry. I got to read what he says for those people who are not watching this uh, live stream. So Joe, let's get back to Joe. Greetings from Berlin. I just got a job offer after finishing the first few Python certificates. Love it. Joe. And I asked how he did. He said, I am working for a company as a salesperson and got into the IT of the company because I tried to help things. That's what I do now, process optimization. Okay, now look at this. Now look at this. See, Joe is, now maybe Joe is, you know, right, let's see. A very common way, now Joe maybe is just, I hope Joe's not trolling me. I'm excited, of course. Samarth, keep that thought on the Java. Let's say you work in sales each month and there's a spreadsheet. Perhaps you write a simple Python program. 
Show your boss the report. On and on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, IT application manager. Right. And the cool thing about that is a lot of what you do for IT application manager is there's a lot of clicking on stuff, but then you can automate stuff too. And frankly, the Python skills make it so that you understand what you're doing. And IT support, there's a ton of jobs in IT support. And, and no, Python is not the core skill, but Python helps you see what's going on inside computers in a way that the people you're helping don't. And so that's, that's why I keep saying, just keep learning. Don't learn so fast that you lose your joy, but just keep learning. Okay, back to this. Can you do a course on Java, uh, Samar? So, so here's something that I, that, um, I'm not gonna do machine learning with Python. I'll let someone else do that one. But uh, Java. So here's, here's, I, I am, when, when Joe says Joe got a job because he took Python, that means a lot to me. I, I, I love it when I get email and I still, to me it's a miracle, right? I mean, if there's no simple way to advance your career. When it works, it's magic. It's been magic for me. If, I, if you'd have told me 15 years ago when I was doing my PhD that I would have been a faculty member at the University of Michigan, I would have laughed at you, right? There's no, it just, it, there's, it's just a series of small steps. It's not like get a certificate and then boom, hit the home run. But when you look back, you realize that, you know, that, that, thing, that thing made that happen. And so there are many, 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 many examples of people who've taken one or two Python courses and Python for everybody. And I'm like, that's not much programming, actually. If you only take the first two, you aren't that, you're not that good as a programmer. But you also aren't scared. And actually being not scared is more important than being highly skilled. Because if you're not scared, you can learn. And then, so people say, how do I get a job? And and I, I don't have a good answer other than this, this answer I've got. But then I, I keep thinking, what if I don't, I, what would it take for me to help you all get jobs where I actually worked on the getting job part, right? Instead of just saying, I'm gonna teach you not be afraid and then just cheer when you get the job. What could I do next? Because I've built a lot of courses and I have a lot of courses. What could I do next that would actually prepare you for a job? Okay. Yeah, of course Python helps you understand Visual Basic for applications. Yeah, that's the point. And you got a promotion. Oh, take Postgres. You want, sorry. Python courses help me understand VBA, Visual Basic for Applications. So I got a promotion last year due to automating most of the spreadsheets for my manager. Now I'm trying to apply to an SQL related position and I have a Postgres for SQL. Yeah, no, I, I don't know about machine learning, Python, Java. Ask Chris Brooks. <laughs> Ouch, got a, got a kink in my leg. Okay, um, so I have been thinking a lot now that I finished Postgres for Everybody, which, which is a great course. And I am thinking about what it would take for me, to, what the next courses for me are courses that I think are gonna help you get jobs. And I'm not saying the courses I've given you so far, Python, Django, PHP, SQL, Postgres, JavaScript, CSS, those are all great skills. Learn them, get them, They'll help you out. But then there is the pro progression towards like being a professional programmer and getting a job as a programmer. And, and this is, is kind of the thing that occurred to me. And that is, um, would I hire you? Right, would I hire you? Would I hire you to work for me? because I have a company and I have students. Why don't I hire my own students? What's wrong? What's wrong with the picture? And so instead of me trying to think about how to prepare you for every job on the planet, I started to think about how to get, what would I teach you given other, 
assuming you took all my classes, what else would I teach you to be prepared to be a professional programmer and work for me so that I would want to hire you? It's not the same as like any job, but it's at least telling you what I would, I want a class that after which I'd want to hire you. And so I look at the kinds of skills that I value. Now, it turns out there's a lot of skills I value, like good web design and good user interface design that I don't have any skills in, and I'd hire you anyways to help me with that, right? But I'm talking about like doing the kind of things that I'm good at. Can I teach you the kinds of skills that would qualify you for the kinds of jobs that I do as a programmer? And so I'm starting to think about that. Um, starting to think about that and I think then the next two two specializations that I'm going to produce um, one is the C programming language and you might say C that's old that's crappy and that's crufty and why would you ever need to know the C programming language and the answer to that is, I haven't written a line of C in 35 years, but I am super glad that I know it. Because if you know C, you are one with the computer. C is an ancient language, and it's the language in which Python is written in. It is the language that Linux is written in. It is the language that your language is written in. It is a hard language to learn. It is a hard language to use well, but it is an amazing tool once you master it. And so I want to teach you how computers work. So the language C is less important than absolutely mastering how computers work. I want you to understand what hardware is, I want you to understand what assembly language is. I want you to understand what machine language is. I want you to understand the essence of speed and why computers are fast and what they're fast at and what they're not fast at. Um, and so I'm going to teach you computer architecture through the C language. Not because I want you to write C. Okay. And then the language I'm going to teach you after that is Java. And, but I'm, I'm not going to teach you just, I will teach you Java. Like it'll be like a specialization in the first two classes will be like Java, 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 Java. Here's our dual for loop in Java and all that stuff. But it's called Building Enterprise Applications in Java. And frankly, I don't care if you go get your job in C Sharp or you go get your job in JavaScript, or you go get your job in whatever, but if you're going to build an enterprise application, and by enterprise application I mean a piece of software that has a million lines of code, and that's where you need a professional programmer. And I'll be honest, there is nothing in computer science, my computer science degree, nothing in a computer science degree that prepared me for working on a million lines of code. Nothing. Computer science is about little tiny bits of code that you really understand really well for your Google interview, which makes me makes me disgusted. Um, Chris Teplovs, I love you, Chris. So by the way, if you have a data science question, you should just ask it in the chat because Chris Teplovs is a genius at data science. Okay, so you can ask Chris Teplovs, whoever's asking the question about machine learning, just whatever Chris Teplovs says, he's the guy. So hi Chris, welcome to the welcome to the show. Um, but here's the thing: the Java class, the enterprise applications in Java, is not exactly about Java. It's about object orientation, and it is object orientation in a way that you have your no computer science professor, none of them, have even the tiniest inkling of what real object orientation is. It is, when used by talented programmers, object orientation is 
an amazing, powerful, and even sometimes ugly tool. It's amazing. The things I do in Sakai, the things I look at in Sakai, the kind of problems that I have to solve in Sakai, and Sugi, my other open source project, I mean, I, I spend days thinking about object design and how to solve the gnarliest of gnarly problems. And I'm not talking like, you have a pet, and a, and a pet has an age, and then you have a cat, and the cat has a meow function, and a dog has a bark function. Sorry, that is not object-oriented programming. That's like object-oriented syntax. But when you are solving a problem, and you have an abstraction, and you're the one below the abstraction, and there's someone in the above the abstraction, and you have 100,000 lines of code that are using this API, and you got to do something inside the API in a way that you don't break 100,000 lines of code, now that's a skill. And that's a skill I'll pay for, right? That's a skill that I will pay for. And when you're good at that, that's what computer science ought to be. Computer science ought to not be a bunch of stupid, write a quad tree hash map algorithm on the board. Yeah, whatever, that's for a book, right? What I want you to be able to do is to walk in a million lines of code and fear nothing. That's what I'm gonna show you how to do. And your language doesn't matter at that point. You need to understand how you break up a million lines of code into little domains of space. And it ain't pretty, it is not pretty. And so in that class, I'm going to use real software, and I'm going to go through case studies of real software. And what software, you might guess? Sakai. Why? It's a million lines of code, and it ain't even pretty. It's an ugly million lines of code. It's ugly, but it's amazing at the same time. And frankly, you got to see ugly code. That's what enterprise code is. Enterprise is code. I bet if you went to work for Oracle and you looked inside the Oracle database, which is worth trillions of dollars, it's crap. But at the same time, it's very effective because it has to be. And so the, the key to professional programming is programming reliable code in a very harsh and unforgiving environment. And that's the amazing skill. And that's the skill that will get you a programming job. And that's where... It's my version of computer science. It's only enough computer science so that you can become a master programmer. So you can go from being an apprentice programmer to a master programmer. And, uh, and so that's what I want to build next. And so the uh, Sam, GUI Python, of course. You know, if I had an infinite amount of time, I would write one. And because uh, one of my favorite languages was Visual Basic back when it was Visual Basic 4. And I loved building uh, drag and drop GUIs, the, the problem. So, um, yeah. So I, I don't think I will. Uh, do, what's your opinion about NoSQL? Oh, of course I have an opinion about NoSQL. What's my opinion about NoSQL? So I recommend that you go to www.pgfree.com. Plus, plus, plus. Oops, that's too big. And go to Lessons. And go to database architectures and watch all these lectures. Database architectures, scaling non uh, SQL databases, that's what ACID is. Cloud applications, first generation cloud applications, base databases, no SQL databases, the technical term for that is base, um, and then evolving ACID databases. And the, and the simple answer to your question uh, is that I think that MongoDB is garbage. Um, I think that there are lots of things in this world that are hypey, that are garbage. Um, MongoDB played a role in pointing out what was wrong with real database systems, but MongoDB ultimately is just a toy. And uh, the fact that before MongoDB, database systems had their head sort of buried in the sand and they were ignoring real use cases. 
And that's a danger for any kind of technology to, to pretend that the, the use cases that they work on currently, ACID, transactions and tables and all that stuff in databases, to pretend that JSON was beneath them, that Postgres and MySQL and Oracle, JSON's like not cool for us, right? We're, we're just so, our, our mathematics of databases is so beautiful that we, we are not going to get in the dirty yuckiness of JSON. And so because all the traditional databases thought that they were, they're so good at what they were, and they were, what they were missing is the fact that there was a new world, the world of JSON that was coming. And they were foolish. And how did they figure out that they'd screwed up? Mongo became popular. Mongo is a lousy database, but it does JSON really, really well. It's amazing at what it does at JSON. It just so happens that that's only about 30% of what a lot of applications need. They need 80, they need 70% of what like an Oracle or a Postgres needs, and then they need 30% of what Mongo needs. And so what Mongo was doing is they were trying, people would be like, you know, I need a new feature in Mongo. And they're like, okay, we'll try to fix it in Mongo. And then Mongo got more and more complex because what they were being told is they needed to add the features that Postgres and MySQL and Oracle already had. And Mongo sucked at that. They were really bad at it. And their features that they added to kind of compete with Oracle, Postgres, and MySQL were implemented horribly. At the same time, Oracle, Postgres, and MySQL finally realized that they were stupid and that they had not noticed that JSON was important. And then what they all started to do was add JSON to Postgres, Oracle, and MySQL. And now we find ourselves 10 years later, and the war of NoSQL is, in all, from my, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't mean that some applications can't use a NoSQL database. That's not saying there'll never be one, but on average, you shouldn't use a NoSQL database. You should use something like Postgres, and then you should use the JSON features of Postgres for the NoSQL part of your application. And, and it took a long time, and you can watch Postgres, because Postgres for everybody, the MOOC, this one I talk about, I'm giving you a summary of the lecture here. You can see that Postgres, I think we're up to Postgres 12 now. Postgres started putting it in in Postgres 8. And then it fixed it in 9 and made it better in 10 and better in 11. Now it's in 12. And I'm honestly really glad. I, I haven't used, po I'm just starting to use Postgres. I use MySQL for most of my career. But um, I'm glad I didn't have to go through the pain of watching Postgres figure JSON out. Because you'd use a feature in Postgres 8 and then they'd be like, oh, kind of got that wrong. Let's fix that in Postgres 9. Oh, hey, we've got to add another feature. Or there's a performance thing that's kind of wrong, and they fix it. Depending. So that you, you can see, if you watch closely as Postgres evolves from 8 to 12, version 8 to version 12, you can see them struggling with and then mastering uh, JSON storage inside of their inside of their systems. And um, and it and you know, the modern Postgres. Thank heaven, I didn't have to go through all the road bumps as it went through all that stuff. Um, and so I would I would probably I could not imagine using a NoSQL database as the only database for an application. Sakai uses uh, Elasticsearch for its search, and that's a NoSQL database. And so, you know, 80% of what Sakai is, Sakai doesn't store grades in a NoSQL database, but it does sort, store documents so that it can search database uh, d those documents in a NoSQL database. That's called Elasticsearch. But that's a NoSQL, Elasticsearch is a NoSQL database. And if you take a look, you will see that I cover in, um, I cover in Postgres for everybody a NoSQL database. Not to say that you should write an app that uses nothing but NoSQL. It just means that every application has SQL and NoSQL attributes to it. And so you gotta, you've got to assemble the right pieces. Of course, my... Race car has a 42 on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's my race car. So it's tomorrow, if you watch on Twitter, uh, skyger.com slash skycar.
Yeah, I have a race car. So I have I have several race cars. I have too many race cars because race cars break, and so the thing to do is to always have more race cars. Lots of race cars. They're all Dodge Neons, and they all are named for the mascot of the Sakai project. It's called the Sakai car, and the Sakai car is the mascot of the Sakai project. The Skyger is like my favorite animal. It's not a lion, nor a tiger, nor a liger. It's a baby tiger. A happy little baby tiger that dances. That's the Skyger. And my race car looks like the Skyger. Right? So you can see the, the race car has ears. That's actually a model of the race car I built before I built the race car so I could test out how the ears looked and take pictures of the model. Um, yeah, so that's my race car. And of course it's 42, but in the racing series that I, I'm in, called the 24 Hours of Lemons, the 24 Hours of Lemons is uh, endurance racing for cheap, crappy cars. And uh, they say that uh, Arushki, I love your question. I'll be right back. Um, they say that the 24 Hours of Le Mans is the most prestigious race in the world, and having seen Ford versus Ferrari and loved it, I have to agree. Um, and the 24 Hours of Lemons' goal is to be the least prestigious racing in the world. And, uh, and it works very hard, and so you have to decorate your car and wear costumes and stuff like that. And the whole idea of uh, the 24 Hours of Lemons is winning is the last thing that matters. What's more important is racing and going fast and having fun and not hurting everybody, anybody. People don't get hurt. Cars rarely get hurt. Every once in a while we dent some, but we work very hard to be safe and still drive really fast and have a really, really good time. So thanks for asking about it. Um, so Dr. Chuck, sorry to be changing the topic. It's okay to change the topic. You are very good at asking questions. Uh, what do you think are the skills lacking in teachers these days? And it is always the education system that's, that uh, a student is considered good. Um, what do you think are the skills lacking in teachers these days? And it is, is it always the education system's fault that a student isn't considered good? Um, I, I put lots of the blame on uh, the failure of education at the feet of the education system. And I believe that most of the people that I know are, that are teachers are outstanding and they spend most of their time fighting the system. And um, if we could just get the system out of the way of teachers um, and let teachers do it, what they instinctively wanted to do, and assume that teachers are good and well-motivated, we would be far better off. Um, the, I don't know if Chris Teplov is still here, um, He'll turn me in, hopefully now, won't turn me in. Um, the, the least fun part of my job is being on the curriculum committee. And I'm such a jerk that they took me off the curriculum committee for a while just because I'm not, I'm not a good team player on the curriculum committee because the curriculum committee, the curriculum committee is where we build the curriculum. And it's an important task and I've seen it done well sometimes. Not all curriculums are bad. Actually, our MADS online curriculum was one that I thought was done really well. But in generally, there's a lot, just too many games that get played with curriculum at all level, all the way from like University of Michigan master's degree all the way around down to first grade. And the curriculum is where all the power games get played. And then the teachers are just then stuck with the curriculum. And um, for me, if there is a battle between curriculum or there's like a conflict between curriculum and teacher, I always go with teacher. Um, I, have, I have never met nor experienced in my career um, a teacher that I consider to be like lousy. I'm, I'm sure they're there. Um, I, I've, seen, I've seen situation, I've seen like online lectures from teachers that I thought were lousy. Um, 
I've seen my kids in classes with teachers that I thought were lousy. Um, and and the, key, the key thing that makes a teacher lousy is arrogance and a teacher who believes too much in themselves and who takes themselves too seriously. And so, um, you know, if I were like, I'm a god and you're my servant, I'm a terrible teacher. And there are a few people in teaching that somehow are a little too impressed with themselves. And so they can't, they can't understand that, um, that learning is a two-way street. I mean, I love teaching. Like if you, every class you've ever seen of mine online was tested with students at the University of Michigan. And that's because when I build an auto grader at the University of Michigan and it breaks, they come into my office and say, hey, it's broke. And I'm like, hang on, let me check. Oh, yeah, you're right, it's broke. So the fact that my auto graders aren't broke in Python for everybody is because they were tested by thousands of students that I had. And I learn from students all the time, all the time. You know, and so when a student comes into my office hours, like I'm thinking of one student in my 664 on-campus class, and and I didn't dread him coming into office hours, <coughs> but I knew that every time he came to my office hours, I had I'd done something wrong because he was a very good student and he got everything. And, and if he needed help, that meant that I got something wrong. And, and I, I really appreciated this student that was far enough ahead, confident enough, sure enough that when I had made a mistake, he would just come into my office hour and say, I, I, I think this is wrong. I'm like, you're right, and I'm so glad you caught it before everyone else saw it. And and so, um, a teacher who believes that somehow they are the the holder of the greatness um, is wrong. In a way, a teacher is much less like an expert and more like a translator, right? So if you imagine a, you know, people talking in two languages and there's two translators, right? What are the translators supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to make sure that these people understand each other. And so if I'm teaching you Python, I think of myself as the trans... I am not the font of Python truth. That's Guido Van Rossum, right? I am a translator between what's in Guido's head and what's in your mind. And that's my job, is to move it back and forth. And teachers who somehow think that they're like God's gift, um, that's what gets in their way. And and again, it's really rare. And I'm, I'm super lucky to work in... A school of my school of information, where we has a core value value people who kind of take a servant approach. It's like servant leadership, but think of servant teaching, right? That ooh, my earpiece is uh, not working. So, hang on. Yeah, Nathan. Yeah, and it, it's clear that you're thoughtful and researched about the value of assessment and how to educate. I I don't feel like that was the case with uh, all my teachers, and. And I agree, and I think that is more um, a problem of a system that expects that. And um, I, I, I couldn't work at a place. Um, so uh, I couldn't work at a place that didn't value um, respecting students, but there are lots of places. And there's one of my questions that was asking about the, uh, like, uh, is education a human right? And should education be free? And um, and like Bernie Sanders and a whole bunch of people in our country um, talk about how education should be free. And I really wish that I could talk to those people um, because I've seen free educations in other countries. And the key to a free education, it, if the education is free, that's not the most important part. Um, what we need is um, really good, very low cost education for certain kinds of things. And so, so honestly, I think Coursera does a great job at meeting the need for low cost education for a certain set of topics. You really shouldn't pay $5,000 to take a Python class. You really shouldn't. You should either get that free if you can't afford it and that class ought to be good. And so what I wish we would do from an education perspective is we would think of the things that need to be free, and those are the things that 
all humans need to know. And I consider Python to be one of those things. That's why it's called Python for everybody. But that doesn't mean that, you know, Calc 3, Calculus 3, is in the category of things everyone needs to know. And neither is organic chemistry, right? And so to say education is free, does that mean organic chemistry is free? Like, who even wants organic chemistry? Probably we've got some organic chemists that are going to yell at me on the chat room right now. So, um, and so for me, the free education has to be carefully constructed to understand the free education that's valuable. It's still got to be a value. And, um, and so I have, I've spent the last decade of my life building what I consider my contribution to that education which should be free. And one of my great frustrations, honestly, is that I can't get anyone to teach this in high schools. I can't get folks in community colleges to teach this. I am working with a, a 40 liberal arts schools led by the Adrian Adrian University, which is a, just down the road here in Michigan, um, to bring technology into liberal arts. And I think that's a, that's a darn good idea. That I, I think that we, we over lionize uh, STEM. Uh, and I love STEM, and STEM is an important thing, but I think we need to understand that STEM should start as a liberal art, and you should, we should understand that there's a certain amount of chemistry that we all should know. We should all know like about how rain works so that when we go out, we don't get wet. Um, but we shouldn't, doesn't need, we need to have like earth science, a PhD in earth science. Uh, it's okay to have a PhD in earth science. It just means everyone doesn't need that, but everyone does need to know about the water cycle. And so I think what we have to find is a way to educate all people in the useful things. And we need to expand the useful things to include things that used to be thought of as elite, like how to program. So that's one of the things I'm trying to do is de-eliteify de programming, right? So that Python is not a skill that only the few elite people have, because I think everyone should have it. So. When the C and computer architecture and Java courses are uh, coming, so um, I, am, I am going to be working on the C course over the summer. The only thing that's weird about the C course is it's not clear to me that I'm going to be allowed to teach that to University of Michigan students. I'm not sure that a curriculum committee at the University of Michigan School of Information would allow me to teach a C class. I could propose it, and they'd be like, see, that's stupid. Don't do it. It's not in our curriculum. It doesn't fit. Um, and so I will find a way, one way or another, to teach the C class. And I might actually teach it for the first time to you all online in the fall, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Chris Hadfield, I follow him. If that, that guy knows joy, right? Joy is important. So the C class, I hope to have uh, the first draft of the C class done by the end of December, which means I'll probably build it. I'll build it over the summer, and then I'll start building the C class um, in the fall. And I might even sort of like teach it informally. I won't, don't think I'll be allowed to teach it on campus because it doesn't fit our curriculum. The Java class doesn't fit our curriculum either. Um, um, and so what will happen then is I always run these classes a couple of times before I give them to Coursera, right? I like the Coursera, I like the classes that I build to have um, well-defined auto graders, uh, well-defined how-to videos, well-defined lectures, and I want to myself have gone through the material a couple of times so that I feel like I've done a good job, right? I feel like I've done a good job. And so, um, Um, and so, yeah, so that's, so the C class, you might, if you like follow me on Twitter, I won't announce it in the Python for everybody because I limit those announcements, but you follow me on Twitter when the C class is something that I am willing to accept like a cohort of students to work on. I'll do that on, uh, so let me show you something. Let me see if I can find this. Is that what it is? Or 
is it CP for me? Oh, I haven't put it up on the web yet. So it's not on the web. It's on GitHub. So I'll show you something cool. Oops. So you can find the beginnings, the really rough beginnings of my C course. And, um, and so the EECS 280 is a class I taught on campus at the University of Michigan. It's a C++ course. So I might actually have a little C++ in the C course. And LBS 290F is a course I taught in like 1991 or something. And that's a Fortran course. But the course that I'm going to base this on, and I'm actually reused the assignment. So you can click on this LBS 290. And you can see I'm going to reuse the assignments from a course I taught. What is assignment two? Is there assignment two? No. Is there assignment three? There's a f Looks like, well, we'll just go assignment five. What's that? No, that's not a good one. Well, that's the solution. Where is it? Oh, here we go. So 10, 11, 12, 20, assignment 4, 3. There's the first assignment right there. So this is a course I taught at Michigan State University in the fall of 1991. And I am literally going to reuse the assignments from a course I taught for the There'll be a specialization, so the first two courses of the specialization will actually use assignments that I taught, my, the first course I ever taught at Michigan State University, not University of Michigan. That's why it's called LBS 290, Lyman Briggs School, for those of you Spartans that uh, know what Lyman Briggs is. It was the first place I went to school, and it was the first place I taught on campus at uh, Michigan State. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rerun these. Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool? if I made the due dates be exactly 30 years later, October 7th, 1991. I can make the due date be October 7th, 2021 for this assignment. Yeah, Samar, that's the idea. I'll build this. I'll have a website. It'll be just like taking it on DJ Free. If I can't teach it on campus, I'll just make like a a website like this, there'll be it'll be called CC for E or something like that, and you'll hear about it on Twitter, and you will be able to join in and log in and do all the homework, get your get your grades, you know, all that stuff. And so yeah, that's how I'll that's how I will prototype it. I'll have to prototype this one online if I can't teach it on campus. So, but you can, I mean. I just, I've got this idea of that's 30 years almost to the day. That'd be awesome. I'll try to make it happen so that 30 years to the day, October 7th, 2021, assignment three. <laughs> and I'm going to try to use these unchanged, meaning that the, type, the commands you type, but that, the, that's the point. Of, that's the point of teaching C. I can teach you a class that's 30 years old. This is classics. This is like the foundation. I taught this before Python existed, right? Python is 20 years old. This class is 30 years old, right? And, uh, okay. Um, so, Arushi, that, uh, Arush, Arushi, that's a, that's, I'll ask you, I'll tell the question. Did I ask this on Quora, but it's not been sent? What do you think of an up-and-coming coding language? Well, other than Python, of course. So I would say I hate every single up-and-coming programming language. I hate them all. Because there's just no point to make a new programming language. Just like I hate Mongo. 
new programming language have one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to point out flaws in the well-established programming languages. So, as an example, uh, Node, which is based Node, the web server, which is based on JavaScript, because it couldn't do it any other way, introduced this notion of asynchronous processing. I mean, literally, Node was forced to use it. It wasn't like it was a good idea. It was like it's the only way they could do it because it was JavaScript. And, and no one thought it was a good idea. Then people started using async, and they're like, oh, wait, there's a lot of things good about async. Async await. And so like, OK, Node is the future. We're not going to use Java. We're not going to use Python. We're not going to use PHP anymore. We're just going to use Node because this async thing is so great. Well, there's a lot of things about Node that aren't so great. But people use it anyways because it had async. Well, guess what? Java's coming out with async. P Python's coming out with async. The idea of async was a good idea, and there's no way that Python would have had it register on their use cases as a need. But when they're losing market share to Node because of async, well, then they're like, oh, I think we better put async in. And so what you've seen throughout the last 20 years, there's a new language that pops up, and it makes a point. It makes its point, and it's right. It's po the point of async and Node and JavaScript is right. The fact that no other language has this figured out is because those languages are lazy. And when you're Python, you're like, hey, I'm Python. I'm 20 years old. Everyone loves me, right? I don't got to do nothing. I just sit back. Oh, wait a sec. Here comes Node and JavaScript. I better go do something. And so it does force these languages to learn, like Java. I've been doing Java since 2000. The concept of async and await in Java? Bah! Well, guess what? It's coming. Why? Because the Java people don't want to lose to the Node people. And now I don't have to change programming languages. All my 20 years of Java experience fit in. And if people have been doing Python for 20 years, well, guess what? Async is there now. And so that's the danger with up and coming languages. Ruby. So the Ruby on Rails. In 2007, I was teaching Ruby on Rails. And I thought it was the greatest language ever. It's not. But it did point something out. It pointed out what was wrong with Python 2. And Ruby on Rails caused Python 3. Because Ruby was built by Mots, who's from Japan. And because Mots was from Japan, he built it so that it understood Unicode at its core, which meant that it could handle every character set on the planet. Python was built by Guido. Guido's from the Netherlands. He's Northern European. United States and Europe, we figure there's like A through Z with a couple of weird characters with like umlauts, and that's it. Which means that ASCII was good enough for Python 1 and Python 2. So Python 2 did not understand Unicode. And Python 2 added some kind of crappy Unicode support but it wasn't as good as Rails. And now, like all these folks from India and China and Japan and Korea are like, I'm not using Python at all. Ruby's like so much better because I can type in all the characters of my language. And I don't have to like call special library teams to convert crap back and forth. Just Unicode works. It should work. And so Python had to face a choice. And, and when they did Python 3 Unicode support across Python was a big reason they did Python 3. So, Unicode's important. Let's all convert to Ruby on Rails. No. Let's just scare Python into doing the right thing. And it took over 10 years for Python 3 to come out. And I would say 50% of what they fixed in Python 3 was Unicode support. And now, guess what? Who needs Ruby on Rails? It's just kind of some ash heap of history now. 
And so that's the problem of up and coming languages is that they always are, they always have some hook. They always have some good thing that we like about them. But that doesn't mean we should switch to them because all the people that do switch to them, all you people that switch to Ruby on Rails, thank you. Thank you so much because you fixed Python and I didn't have to switch to Ruby on Rails. Like I talked earlier, I'm whinging about having to learn React. Ugh. I don't want to learn React. I want to skip React. I want to go to whatever's next. I don't want to learn every one of these darn things because I don't think React is really the right answer in the long term. I don't think it is. But I don't have anything better than React. And now I have to re learn this thing that I know in five years is going to be just like Ruby on Rails. It'll be a joke. And I'll have wasted a whole year learning it and coding in it. And then I'll be like, yeah. Because I loved Ruby on Rails for a while. And then I realized at the end, whoops, it's destined to be a joke. And I switched away from Ruby on Rails because it was kind of little tiny little corner. So I'm not a big fan of up and coming anything um, because they only seem to last about four to five years. And then the established languages, libraries, frameworks consume them. So. Oh, holy crap. Jesse, the question's from the live stream. Uh, are you think it's this pencil icon? Where is it? Where is it? It's not the... Um, Yeah, I'm doing pretty bad in this Quora, whole Quora thing. That's a good question about Flask and Django. I have a whole lecture on that. I am just not seeing... I cannot figure out how to find the questions that you are asking. On the top of the page where there are, oh, notifications. Oh! Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate it. There it is, I think. Oh, I'm going to actually do a Quora for a minute. We'll come back. So, oh, let me do the class thing first. Man, i got to get rid of some of my tabs. That's part of my problem. I always end up with too many tabs. Get rid of tab, 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 tab. Pew, 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 pew. So the Flask versus Django, www.djfree.com. Lessons. No, week three. Oh, no, week four. Here we go. No, week... What the heck? Why don't I have this? Oh, I bet I know why. Oh, because it's based on in Coursera. Coursera No, not Y Python. There it is. There's an ad. Ooh, that's because it's University of Michigan. Okay, so here's a whole lecture. Why I teach Django with me, Dr. Chuck. 
See, I talk about Flask, talk about Python, PHP, Flask, Django or Flask. Talking about Flask, talk about Django. So I do that. How do I maintain my cool? Drink water. No, I I just maintain my cool right here. I'm, I'm live and I've been going live for two hours and 24 minutes. Um, all I am, the, the key is just, I'm comfortable. I just am not pressuring myself. If I screw up, if something blows up, I'm not, just don't put pressure on myself. Uh, and it's okay, no pressure. Okay, let's go answer that question that someone actually put in. I want to answer a Quora question. Click, where did I put that question? We found it, we found it. So not Sam, that's a good question. I just finished Python for everybody and now wondering what to do next. I know you just made an SQL course on database. What should you do next? Um, uh, so I, I don't know. It depends on where you want to go. Um, and it depends on what you like best about Python for everybody. I, the, the two choices would be Postgres for everybody, which is a non-trivial course. But if you really liked SQL, and some people do love SQL, it's a, it's, you're, you're ready to go, but it's challenging. Django for everybody is challenging too, and you're equally ready to go for that. And so for me, I, I actually want to do a study of who goes from Python to Django and who goes from Python to Postgres. If you're thinking about being a data scientist, Python to Postgres. If you're thinking more about being more of a programmer, Python to Django. That's my theory on that. Oh, this one here is a good one. After completing Python for everybody, oh, let me make it bigger. What would be the next best step? Um, so I think that um, you have two choices, <laughs> which is exactly the same question I was asking before. Um, I think that you have two choices, um, depending Where you think you might be going? If you are considering the um, uh, data scientist path, hurry over to Postgres. Quite ready for it. But if you're more interested thinking you want to be a programmer, especially a web developer, then I recommend Web applications for everybody. PHP slash MySQL because it is a lower level coverage of the same ideas as web applications for everybody, uh, Django for everybody. And since it is likely that your first job might neither be, might be something other than Django or PHP, the most important skill 
is to be a quick learner. <laughs> and the more different things you have seen, the more rapidly you will pick up something like uh, .NET or Node.js. I like that. I'll clean it up later. Is the Python SQL course on Coursera? Absolutely. It is in my drop downs here. Postgres for everybody, right there. Postgres for everybody. Specialization. So that's already there. Yeah, so Postgres is the course on current, well, so I'm currently teaching the course that's equal to Django for everybody in on campus. And then in our online Masters of Applied Data Science, I'm teaching what is equivalent to Postgres class. And so the Postgres class is like a part of my, like it brings me great joy because I finally got to teach only SQL. And I've taught SQL, beginning SQL, too many times. Um, Python for Everybody has it, Django for Everybody has it, and Web Application for Everybody have basic Postgres in them, but I wanted to go deeper, like what's a transaction, and how do different indexes work, and what do full ten text indexes look like, and how does NoSQL work, and this is a four-course specialization, and I, it has a tiny bit of Python in it, but in general, it is all about database and all about SQL, and so I, I felt like I had to eventually, there were so many things that I just had to leave out of those other courses, and this is like, in the Postgres context, you know, all the stuff I wanted to ever talk about in terms of database. So, yeah. So, yeah, here, let's do that. I don't know if I can even paste a thing in there. Boogada, boogada, boogada. I bet I can paste in the chat if I'm super, oh no, I can't paste two different computers. <laughs> uh, let's see, what should I choose from PHP and Java for application development? So if, um, so that, so, Dibkar, that, that's a good question. Should I choose PHP or Java for application development? Um, and, the, and the answer is there is no one answer for that question. Um, I, I have two projects, the Sky Project and the Tsugi Project, and one is a PHP project and one is a, Python, a Java project. Um, I haven't yet built a really gigantic thing in uh, Python yet. I just, I just I haven't found the right thing to do. And, but the choice of PHP in one project, the choice of Java in another project, I wouldn't, I wouldn't reconsider those choices. I wouldn't say, oh, I should have chose PHP for that one class, uh, for that one application. I wouldn't do that. Um, and so it all depends. And it often depends on the people you're working with or sometimes the country you're in. And so if you're in a country that doesn't have a lot of infrastructure or hosting costs are high, PHP is a really good language for that because PHP is cheap and universal. Um, Java is more costly to host, but it's more powerful and capable. Um, but if you're working with a team of people that know Java, telling them to learn PHP is just going to be a waste of your time. I mean, I'm starting a project this summer where I'm going to be I'm grumping about React. Um, there's four people other than me on this team, and they know React. And so I'm sitting here going like, I can either criticize them and say, why do you use React? Or I could just learn React and get a lot more work done. And so I'm going to use React. Um, I wouldn't have done it, but because I'm going to hang out with four talented people that know React, eh, makes it easier. So, um, so it's that's a tough. Um, uh, does it talk about how to set up Postgres? Um, does Postgres for everybody talk about how to set it up? Um, not so much. There's a whole section later in the class that talks about things like master-slave replication, but it's not like um, how to do it. It's like the concept of master-slave replication. Um, and so it, it's, it, the concepts are there. Uh, what do I think future university should teach? That's a good question. And I think that the curriculum for in the future has to evolve. Um, 
I think that we just have to accept new things and we can't just say I've got this stuff done and so that's what the curriculum is. I think that's the flaw of computer science right now is they've got a curriculum that's kind of baked and locked and loaded and they uh, they don't. So I don't know. I think we just, I don't worry too much about the future. Japan, I agree completely. You say, uh, I think while education is somewhat dem democratized by MOOCs, learning has shifted towards shortcut professional skills versus fundamentals of thinking, exchanging, and coping with difficulty learning itself. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, anytime someone comes up to me and tells me, like, online education is the future, the universities are dead. There'll no in five years, no one's going to even go on a campus. I'm like, okay, here's your choice. I'm going to give you a free on campus for you have a you have a child who's 17 years old, and I'm going to give you a free on campus University of Michigan education, or I'm going to give you a free University of Michigan education where your child lives in your basement and takes everything online. Which of those two things do you want? They're both free. It's not a cost difference. It's not like the online is cheaper. They're both free. Tell me someone who would say, yeah, I want my 17-year-old child to stay in my basement for the next four years and learn professional skills. No. No one would want that. They might accept it if they can't afford the alternative, but without cost, then there is no question that sending your child to a residential education is the best because the goal of a residential education, frankly, hopefully no one from Michigan's listening, is to get your kids out of the house. The whole thing is, as humans develop, at a certain age, they have to be sort of kind of surrounded by a protective shell, like the same neighborhood, your parents, and children interacting, you know, have a few friends, and but they see a very uniform world, right? And the, that world is different depending on what country you grow up on, what your economic status is, but everybody kind of grows up in kind of like a, a safe environment so that they can kind of grow up. Because if you just kind of threw them in a complex environment with like people from all countries, food from all countries, people arguing and disagreeing with each other. Um, if you took a five or eight year old child and you dropped them into a, a diverse, complex situation, they wouldn't make it. They don't have the coping skills. So it's important for children to grow up in a safe, consistent environment, whatever that is, um, so that they're ready. But the problem is, is that safe, consistent environment doesn't really let them know who they really are because if you've lived in a traditional family, gone to a small school, lived in a neighborhood, you are simply like a shadow of your parents at that point. You are version 2.0 of your parents partly. And now I take you out of that and I put you, you come to Ann Arbor and you meet the most diverse population you could possibly meet. You eat crazy food. You go to football games. And in that, you begin to develop an identity of yourself that is not your parents. And we as humans are programmed at some point between say like 12 and 20 to find our own identity. To find our own identity. And this is why Teenagers sometimes cause lots of problems because they're trying to escape this safety that's been necessary for a part of their life, but now the safety is the problem. And I'm not saying kids should do stupid things or be unsafe. What I'm saying is they, see, they need to see the world and they need to see who they might become that's not the same as their parents. And, and so that's why what G is saying in the chat, that education, learning is shifted toward shortcut professional skills, the fundamentals of thinking, exchanging, coping with difficulty, learning itself, you're 100% right. And this is where, to the extent that you can, 
getting learning from, not the exact same clone of what you've been doing for your first 12 years of your life or whatever, um, is important. And I will say this, and, you know, I'm not saying that MOOCs are the answer. I love residential education. I don't think there's ever going to be a time where residential education is not seen as the best possible education. But the one thing that MOOCs do do for you is they allow you to see different kinds of teachers, different ways of teaching, teaching from multiple cultures. So someone asked earlier, what was the most impressionable meeting I had with a, someone during your overseas uh, meet and greet? And I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you, I don't know why this one sticks out, but I was in a, uh, a former Eastern European country. And And I asked, like, you have a free education. Why do you take MOOCs? And they said, we're a former Soviet bloc country, and our education is very gray. Our teachers are all very boring. They do a good job. The books are okay, and they teach well, and it's free. But there's little inspiration in their teaching at the school I go to. And I use MOOCs to hear from an inspirational teacher. And so that's a good example of learning from someone outside your home culture, right? And so MOOCs do allow that. Um, I don't think we take as good of advantage of that. The other thing that MOOCs allow us to do, is, me as a teacher, and you might see this in the upcoming C course, is I can make a course that I don't have to get approved by the curriculum committee. I can make a course that I think is the course you need and the course I need to teach and I need to learn from you and we need to do it together. But I don't need to get approval from a committee to do it, right? And so I see over and over and over again when teachers move into MOOCs, I tell them, don't teach the same class you always teach. Distill the class down to the essence of what's most valuable for students. And, 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 and to be honest, I think this is a mistake, they won't let me teach post, uh, Python for Everybody on campus anymore. They thought it was too easy. So they made it, they, they said, I can't teach that class. We teach a harder Python class. And there are, there are negative consequences to that. There are negative consequences to teaching a more challenging Python class. But you can be in a curriculum committee and you say, let's vote. Should we go with the stick with the easy Python class that everyone loves or should we teach a more complex Python class so students learn more? Well, like a quarter of the people say, well, how about we teach a class that the students retain more? And then three quarters say, no, learn more, learn more, learn more. And then more rigor. And then poof, you can't teach the class anymore. But in MOOCs, I can teach the class, right? I can teach the class that I believe is the right class for you, even if the curriculum committee doesn't think it's the right class for our on-campus students. I still disagree with them on that, but doesn't matter. You get the class that I believe is right. And, and I think that a lot of the MOOCs that you take on Coursera and elsewhere are those things that we as teachers are doing outside of a curriculum system. And therefore, we are making choices about what we're going to teach. Proposing courses inside of a curriculum system is really frustrating. Really frustrating. Sorry, I, I ranted about that for a while. Yeah, MOOCs are good to learn from different kind of teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excite students, joy, happiness. There's, there's, it's, it's not facts. It's not just dry facts. Yeah, smart. I'm, I'm not going to do a video. I, I tend not to do things that have that you can Google, right? Because those things also change. Because if I did a Postgres, then it was a Postgres 12, and now it comes Postgres 14, and I, I can't do. Um, Mobile development? I don't know. I haven't done that. <laughs> I tend to do responsive design. So, uh, Tanmiai says, why is Python not used for application development? So, the answer is, why is Python not used as application development as people's first choice? Because it definitely is being used for application development. 
I had a student in our online master's program and she was showing me what she did at work. And she was creating applications so that people didn't have to type Python run report.py. They would have like a thing that says, which report do you want to run? I'm like, oh, this report or that report. So she had Builder all, all over Python, but she didn't want to just hand them the code, so she handed them an application. And I think she used a tickle TK to do, oh no, that was some, there was something else. Something with a V in it, but whatever. She had built this application and they compiled it to like a .exe file. So they didn't even get the Python, they just ran this program and it said, what report do you want? And it did things. And so it's not like they don't do it. The question is really um, why they don't do it for a cool desktop application. And the answer is that um, it is really difficult to write a Windows application that looks like it belongs on Windows and a Mac application that looks like it belongs on a Mac and use the exact same code. It just, you can do it, and there are portability layers, and there are, I've used them in the past, and I've built simple simple applications that worked on a Mac and a PC with one piece of code. But either they were limited to simple problems that you could solve, or they um, didn't look quite right. They didn't look as good as if you just did it. And so it's, it's unfortunate that those, the fact that it didn't look quite right or had limited functionality is enough to keep people from doing desktop applications in a portable way. And it's really unfortunate. The little known fact is that there was a time in the old days, this has got to be late 90s, where Microsoft had purchased a 20% interest in Apple and um, Microsoft did purchased a 20% interest in Apple, and they had changed their Microsoft development environment, uh, Visual C++, so that it could uh, take the same application and make it run on Mac and Windows. So I could build an application and on a Windows box, and I could tell it to make me a Mac version of the application. And that Mac version of the application looked pretty good. And there was a way even to connect up a Mac, and so you could do debugging on your Windows box, and the application's running on your Mac box, and there's a little connector between them. And uh, that was like Visual C 4.2 or something. And, um, and they used that to build Word for Mac, PowerPoint for Mac, and I bet they still do use it that way, meaning that I bet the Word for Mac and the PowerPoint for Mac share a bunch of code. What they decided was, is they didn't want people like you and me to be able to build applications as easily as Microsoft, so they stopped distributing the way to take a Windows app and make it be compiled for a Microsoft app, uh, for, for, a, for a Macintosh. And uh, I thought if they were going to do that, that would be cool. But that was just a really brief moment where I saw that and I'm like, okay, that is, that's a big deal for them to be able to do that. And then it kind of was poof, taken away from us, sadly. And I still think that Microsoft does it internally. Okay. Whoa, we only have, really? We have 12 minutes left. How time has flown. Mobile development, Python, I think it's the same answer. I think the, the problem with mobile development is it's such a moving target, and it literally has been a moving target for 15 years. And, uh, and so it's difficult. So why Django? So, uh, Sandro, why Django, why not Flask? Um, I have somewhere in there, there is my answer to that question, and I got that thing. But here's the short version of it. Um, when I, I was teaching the PHP class, which became Web Applications for Everybody, and the curriculum committee told me to stop teaching PHP and instead teach Python. So I'm like, okay, which Python should I teach? I, I didn't mind, because it created Django for everybody, right? So I actually had a year. They told me that I could teach PHP for one more year. So during that year, I did research on whether I should teach um, Django 
or uh, or flask. And I saw another teacher taught a flask class, and I looked at it, and I'm like, "Ooh, that's that class." isn't even the the resulting application at the end of the class was less sophisticated than what I was teaching in PHP. So I ran around and I asked people, like, do you do web stuff in Python? They go, yeah. Do you like Flask or Django? And I and half of them said they loved Django and hated Flask, and the other half said they loved Flask and hated Django. And it was really, I couldn't predict when I walked up to somebody and asked them that question what they were going to say. And so, um, so then I, I, I didn't get an answer. I did. I didn't. I got inconclusive data from my informal survey of people as to whether to, which one to do, because people liked the one they liked. And um, then I asked the question: If you were going to learn both Flask and Django, which would you learn first? And at that point, everybody said Django. Almost everybody. Lots of people still said, "I love Flask. Must do Flask." But in general, people acknowledge that if you're starting from scratch. And so that's how I chose Django, is that if you're gonna, so that you can learn Flask, and everything you learn in my Django class will help you learn Flask. But if I teach you Flask, Django doesn't make much sense to you. But, because Flask and Django have similar patterns, but Flask is more like, here's just a bunch of Lego blocks, and Django is, here's a car that you can take off and put pieces on. Um, and so that's that's why I didn't use Flask. and. And I made that decision three or four years ago now. And I feel good about that decision. I feel like that made a lot of sense um, after the fact because what I really learned was people who build Flask applications tend to build uh, complex applications often with microservices. And microservices sounds good, but it's a hard way to build applications. And if you're building microservices, I totally get why Flask is what you like. Because Flask is well set up to make a small thing, not a big thing, a small thing. And in microservices, you make a bunch of small things, and then you kind of pull them all together. And so Flask is great for that, but that's not what I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach you how to build an application. And if you want to break it down into pieces of applications later, fine, go learn Flask. And so that's why I chose it. Uh, MATLAB and uh, Julia, I'm, that's not my that's not my skill set. Um, is this a re-upload? Uh, I don't know what that means. We're live right now, M H. We're truly live. So let me let me say this. Oops, wrong wrong button. We are live now. <laughs> Guess I can't type it. I V E now. There we go. So yeah, that's not my skill. MATLAB is more engineering. Julia, I got no idea. What are your views of the career path of data science and its scope? I think I think data science is really cool. I honestly think data science is amazing. Uh, we have, um, I didn't build it, but the applied data science with Python is a very popular specialization in Coursera. Uh, in Coursera. Um, Applied Data Science with Python, Michigan. That's our Master of Applied Data Science, oh, Coursera. I can't type, but Google, you're supposed to fix that. Yeah, there we go. We call it Ad Swappy. Yeah, and Chris. Chris plus three more instructors. Um, and so, uh, yes, it will be recorded um, uh, somewhere. Just probably on, on the online UMich, online UMich EDU uh, YouTube channel. Um, so, so I've been sort of playing, and the, the whole Python thing kind of got me to be sort of near data science. And what what is cool to me about data science is. You know, if you go back in like 2007, 2008, when we started building our first data science curriculums, um, it felt like data science was kind of like, it, it, it felt like it wasn't a field by itself. It just felt like you're this, and data science is like a part of, you know, you, you know a little SQL and maybe some machine learning and some of this, and, 
And yeah, you're really a user interface designer, but you know a little bit about um, data science because that's good because maybe you want to do some analysis for your user experience or whatever, right? So back in 2007, 2008, it felt like data science wasn't a field. And you couldn't say, I'm going to graduate with a degree in data science and go get a job in data science. Not true anymore. Now, that's just a real career path. There are companies that say, data scientists needed. It's like a known destination. It's one of the kind of career paths you can take. And so we got this specialization. Um, and of course, we have our, what we, that's called Ad Swappy. And then we have MADS. The Master of Applied. Oh, that's interesting. They're spamming our keyword. <laughs> there you go. Our Master of Applied Data Science. Now, this is a really, it's an expensive, full credit thing with Slack channels and all kinds of stuff, but. It's a great program. It's two years old now. We just graduated our first cohort uh, last week. And, uh, and again, what a difference a decade makes um, to the point where you just go to school for data science. You get a degree in data science. We don't teach you HTML. We don't teach you CSS. We don't teach you what a library is about. We just say like SQL, machine learning, data pipelines, visualization. And that now is enough to be a field. And it's, it's a solid field. It's a fine field. And to some degree, that's why I made it so that you go from Python for everybody to Postgres for everybody and skip Django for everybody, skip web applications for everybody, because there are some people for whom, like, getting to be a super programmer or even building a web application is just not on your track. It's not where you're going. And so just, just, just get there. You're going to be a data scientist. It's a legit thing to do. Uh, go ahead and do it and stick with it, and you'll be fine if that's your interest, right? It's, it's not sort of as user-facing in some ways as building web applications. I've always liked building things for other people. I'm just a tinkerer, and I like sharing. Um, but some people just want to, like, build cool pie charts and cool visualizations and help people understand what a company or organization is doing in, through data. And so it's a totally worthy thing. So... Pakistan, yeah, that I, I would need, if I was going to Pakistan, I would need somebody to locally be my guide, right? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm a seasoned traveler. I just don't know how to hop off a plane in Pakistan without knowing somebody. Um, you know, and, and I, I mean, I go to, so when you go to a country for the first, I mean, I'm a seasoned traveler, but I am scared when I'm going to a country for the first time. And I noticed it like when I was, I've been now to Korea like three or four times, the first time I was going to Korea. And I've been to Japan, and I've been to China, and I've been to a lot of places. So here I am on an airplane on the way to Korea, getting ready to land, and I'm like, am I going to be okay in Korea? Will I figure it out in Korea? And like, yes, Chuck, you'll figure it out. You've landed lots of places and figured it out. But honestly, the first time I was show, flying into Korea, there was a little thing in the back of my mind, like, I don't know what's going to happen. Same when I went to South Africa by myself for the first time. And you got to meet me at the airport because I'm scared. I'm not scared, but... Please meet me at the airport and like carry me, take me around by the hand. And then now, now when I go to South Africa, uh, don't meet me at the airport. I'll just be fine, right? So first time to go into anywhere, I need a little bit of help. So, yeah. Yeah, so, Henry, are you one of our current students? Yeah. And I'll come to India as soon as I can, as soon as it's safe. I mean, I again, my heart goes out. I mean, I... I see all the pictures from India, and I hope it's not as bad as it really looks because it looks really bad, but that reminds me of places that I've been in India, and I think, you know, I've been those kind of places. Oh, wow. Vasumita Bannock. Hello, Dr. Chuck. Any volunteer opportunity we can find after completing Pi for Everybody? One of these days, I'm going to set it up so that you can volunteer working for me, work on uh, Sakai, and help us in our QA department. That's what I want to do, but i got to get my act together for that. Um, that's part of, part of my plan when I go to the Java 
uh, enterprise applications for everybody is that I will also then have a, my own program for internships that anybody can apply to that has completed all my courses, the C course and the Java course, then I'll have an internship program that's interning with me. And because uh, internships are like a necessary step. And those internships will be in the Sakai project or the Sugi project. But I got to kind of get organized. I don't, I can't. The problem with internships is they take energy and you got to organize them and man manage them. So, yeah. What do I think about artificial intelligence in the future? Tan my future of humans. How much time we got? I don't think we really have a tremendous deadline. But let's just <laughs> let's make let's make this the last thing. So, um, Kumar, I'm unable to read the book, but I'm lazy. I love to go through the videos and love Pi for E. You know what that's called? It's called learning styles. You have a different learning style. Don't apologize. You're fine. So don't apologize. So Tan Miai, uh, what do you think about artificial intelligence and the future of the human will be like the Ex Machina movie? So um, I was at the University of Notre Dame about five years ago, and they were rolling out some new program, and they were having like a day-long celebration where they invited distinguished guests somehow I snuck into, uh, they invited distinguished guests to give talks about one thing or another, right? And uh, it, was, it was fancy. They put us in their fancy on-campus hotel and, uh, and just like they had like a dinner for all the distinguished guests. And, and it was, you know, it was, it was a class act. And one of the things that they did was they had either purchased or rented these two robots and the robots had wheels and cameras, and they were like as tall as a human being. And they, there was a person that was running the robot, and you'd see the person's face. And we were acting like this robot was a human. We would talk to the human. We would take it along with us. When we'd go get coffee, the robot would... <laughs> drive out to the coffee place and we'd like chat with the robot and there might be little groups of people at, during coffee break that are talking and the robot would walk up and talk with us in the coffee breaks, right? Like it's the future, right? There's a lot of future there, right? Pretty cool. So, um, so that, you know, as the day progressed, we just kind of, there was, it wasn't, wasn't too flashy, just the robot was go into sessions and they would pick what room they would go to and the robot would go to one session in a room or come to another session you'd look up and there'd be the robot in the back of the room and uh, and then we were coming toward the end and they say we got a really cool thing and they had built this really cool um, I don't know Tim if we built one yet where you uh, it's the thing where you write with the uh, luminescent pens on glass they built one of those things and they're like Chuck you want to come in the basement and see our cool thing where we write on glass it's really cool and you get to write on the back and then you can write all your stuff but then we flip it around so that so do we did we build one of those Tim yeah so we built one at Michigan too yeah we built one at Michigan too and so um, and so uh, so I said yeah yeah I do want to see that I'd seen some videos of it and so we, we go in and um, we all jump in an elevator and the robot decides to come along and see the thing too. And uh, so, so we're going in the elevator and as we walked in the elevator, one of the Notre Dame people reached out and like grabbed the robot by the neck and picked it up and stuck it in the elevator. And I'm like, what did you just do? That robot is a person. And they're like, well, it uses Wi-Fi. And when you put the robot in the elevator, <laughs> it loses everything. Like the robot just stops. There's no face. And so if you want the robot to go in an elevator, you got to put it in the elevator, go down a floor, then you take it back out and let it sort of reconstitute its soul when it gets out of the elevator. And so to answer your question, and that is, what do I think about artificial intelligence and... Um, Ex machina, I say it's going to work fine until you get in an elevator, and then it's not. So, so with that, thank you 
for spending time with me. I've enjoyed this immensely. And, uh, and I'm working with Tim in my ear, and maybe we'll just start doing this regularly a little more often until, um, until we can get back to seeing you in person again. So thank you, and, uh, and cheers. <laughs>